Let's get started. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this tutorial. Okay, I'm Fabrizio. I'm going to uh, be the speaker for the first session. Um, I'm going to hold this tutorial also with Beatrice and a guy who are here present with me. Uh, we're going to have this tutorial in uh, into nine sessions. This is going to be articulated in nine sessions. Uh, and we will have two uh, uh, coding um, parts as well. Beatrice will take care of them. Um, okay, a few words before we start about this tutorial. Uh, we deal with the expressive power of graph neural networks here. And uh, everybody's welcome. The, we try to keep it eye level without uh, requiring any particular background knowledge. And the focus will be on joining the dots. So we want to explore uh, many methods that have been explored, that have been proposed in the past, and somehow categorize them together into families and uh, perhaps, you know. Um, um, study the relations between the, this, these families together. Uh, as I was saying, we want to keep this eye level. And uh, so we, of course, uh, uh, given the this idea, we don't want to uh, list all possible works on expressive graphic networks. There are really uh, zillions of them, of them now. Uh, we don't want to get too much into details. Um, yeah, I and uh, we hope this is going to be helpful for as many people as possible. Um, yeah, I've already said we have also hands on sessions. Let's start. So in this uh, first session, I'm going to um, set some um, uh, common notation and I'm going to talk about some preliminaries. Let's start with graphs and uh, graph isomorphism. Then we're going to talk about graph neural networks and equivariance and variance and uh, start to introduce the concept of expressive power. Um, I guess you know what uh, graphs are. So they are mathematical objects to model relational structures, in particular pairwise relations. Um, we typically de define them as tuples, where we have a set of vertices or nodes, a uh, set of edges between uh, these vertices. And uh, in this tutorial, we'll consider to have also node features, so features uh, living in some uh, real vector space associated to uh, to the nodes. We might also consider the case where also we where we additionally have edge features. This is typically done. We won't really get into um, consider this case into this tutorial, but many of the results we're going to present. Uh, also cover this uh, this case. Um, we know the graphs are really powerful abstractions. We can model uh, phenomena in real world, um, ranging from uh, molecules to even uh, social networks and um, cellular interactions, interactions, for example, between proteins. Uh, in general, if you want to use them, given they are powerful abstractions, we need to represent them in a way so that we can do calculation on, on, on them, right? And just to set some common, um, um, uh, you know, just to agree on uh, the the way we represent graphs, we typically represent graphs as uh, jointly as a uh, adjacency matrix, where we store the connectivity information, and a uh, feature matrix, where we store the features associated to nodes. Uh, we can also merge the two together in a tensorial representation, where we arrange the feature matrices on uh, the diagonal terms. And a guy will uh, talk about this uh, again in uh, in his sessions uh, more in specifics. Um, let's start with a very important concept for us, that is the concept of graph isomorphism. Um, so in general, we might have two graphs, and they may or may not encode the same relational structure, right? So if you want to verify whether this is the case or not, we formalize this and we do this via isomorphism. So the two graphs will encode the same relational structure if they are, if there is a, there exists an isomorphism between them. So what is an isomorphism? It's a bijective mapping between the nodes of the node sets of the two uh, graphs in a way that it preserves adjacency. And in the case that the graphs are attributed, uh, they would also pre preserve the features of the nodes. So in, in practice, we mean that uh, if uh, nodes U and V in the first graph are uh, form an edge, uh, then the, 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 the couple formed by their images according to the isomorphism will form an edge in the second graph as well, and vice versa. And when we say we want to preserve features, it means that for a given node associated to a certain node feature, its image according to the isomorphism will be associated to the same uh, feature as well. Um, OK, let's then crack on what's uh, with our machine learning part. Um, graph neural networks, uh, in general, are parameterized functions on graphs. So they model functions which have as uh, domain the set of attributed graphs and as codomain uh, some uh, real but potentially i-dimensional I vector space. Uh, they have parameters theta we can learn uh, if we have a training set. 
and uh, in particular we have that uh, they can solve problems related to node predictions on graphs or graph property predictions even link predictions in, in this tutorial our focus is going to be on graph property prediction um, okay the most popular form of gnn is uh, message passing so message passing neural networks are graph neural networks which are constructed this way we stack a uh, set of message passing layers, and then we uh, perform a graph, uh, graph readout function, which give us, uh, will give us a final overall graph representation. So these are the equations for uh, message passing and the final readouts. Uh, typically, we distinguish two functions, the uh, message function, which collects no uh, information from neighbors in a graph, and an update function, which uh, merges, combines this, the representation of the current representation of a node, with the aggregated representation of neighbors and uh, updates the representation of a node. So uh, we parameterize these functions with uh, multi-layer perceptions and um, there are very interesting properties of this architecture. So first of all, um, message passing is sparse. So as I was anticipating, whenever we update the representation of a node through our network, we do this in a way that uh, only aggregates, or typically only re aggregates representation from the direct neighbors. In this way, we can retain complex, well, forward pass complexity, which is linear in the number of edges, which is um, very advantageous in general. And uh, this also is related to uh, the fact that these models uh, have a local inductive bias. So they have a bias towards learning uh, functions which um, um, are uh, you know uh, are local in the graph from for some sense of for some uh, notion of closeness in the graph in uh, the topology of the graph, very advantageous inductive biases, but most importantly, especially for our talk, there are other inductive biases which are very important and which are enjoyed by message passing neural networks. The first one is that every message passing layer is equivalent, and the network as a whole is invariant. When we mean, well, what we mean by this is they are invariant or equivariant to permutations of uh, nodes. Let's try to describe these uh, concepts. So when we talk about equivariance for a certain function, we, we, we say that the function is equivariant to permutations if um, it commutes with the action of a permutation on its inputs. In, the, in our case, um, the representation that is uh, in output by a message passing layer on the permuted inputs will be uh, es essentially permuted in the same way. In terms of invariance, we know when we say that the whole architecture is invariant when uh, the output of the network does not uh, depend uh, on the on per permutations we apply on the inputs. So um, uh, we can say the, the, the representation is the same modular permutations in the inputs. Um, this is a very important inductive bias and. Uh, in 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 the sense, given that nodes in the in the um, in the in, in the vertex set are uh, you know they they can be ordered arbitrarily, uh, MPNNs respect the main symmetries of graphs, and in the sense we can say that they implement the geometric deep learning blueprint, given that they stack equivalent layers uh, followed by an invariant global readout. These models are very um, uh, so. Um, advantages in practice and the fact that they are invariants to permutation of their inputs um, make them uh, particularly interesting in the sense that uh, they would inevitably assign the same representation to isomorphic graphs. Um, this is something we would actually, this is a property we would like to have in general when, whenever we model graphs, right? So if you think about the fact that two isomorphic graphs, as we anticipated, they model the same, they uh, represent the same relational structure, of course, it's desirable that a network applied to these graphs will output the same representation. So very nice property. What happens instead to an isomorphic graph? So in general, we can think of, uh, of this as the following. So we might want to set a general desideratum, right? We want uh, that um, our model outputs the same representation for isomorphic graphs, given that they uh, represent the same relational structure. On the other hand, um, we want non-isomorphic graphs to get distinct representations, right? This is, would be an advantage in practice, because if we are able to assign distinct representations to non-isomorphic graphs, which are actually distinct, relational structures, then if we really want to put them uh, closer together, 
uh, we can do it via downstream classifier based on the task we are trying to solve. So this would be, uh, you know, the ideal scenario. Uh, what happens in the case of MPNNs, though, is that uh, these models do not uh, really satisfy this desideratum. So there are uh, cases in which for non-isomorphic graphs, MPNNs would inevitably assign them the same representation. So no matter how we parameterize the update and message, and message functions, not even the readout, we will always be in the situation where two graphs which are distinct uh, will get the same, get represented in the same manner. This is not, of course, uh, true for every possible pair of non-isomorphic graphs, but there are pairs. Um, in, in uh, you know, to give a more visual example, what can happen is that we may have non-isomorphic graphs getting into the same um, uh, point into the um, representational um, uh, space. This is in general, uh, this might be in general problematic. So if we want to take a look at possible examples, these are two um, abstract, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, abstract graphs. They are uh, two graphs in the family of skip, circular skip links. Um, what happens with these graphs is that they are obviously non-isomorphic, they are distant, right? But uh, they will inevitably assign the same representation. This is just one example where MPNNs would fail at satisfying our desideratum for uh, distinct representation for non-isomorphic graphs. But this happens also in practice. So this is uh, um, an infamous, I would say, pair of uh, real-world uh, molecular graphs. We have on one hand the de decline, on the other hand, bicyclopentyl. What happens is that although they are obviously distinct molecules, any MPNN would assign them the same representation uh, in any case, no matter the, the parameters. So this might be problematic in practice because think of the fact that maybe we would like to predict different properties for these two molecules. This would not be possible because they would be essentially, uh, they would coincide in our representation hidden space. So and the, 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 the idea of distinguishing graphs actually is related to uh, universal function approximation. And in the case of uh, standard for feed forward neural networks or MLPs, this is a concept we are very well familiar with, right? So we know that MLPs under certain assumptions, they can approximate any uh, continuous function on a compact set up to arbitrary precision, right? This is what one of the things we really like about message, uh, about um, multilayer perceptrons, right? So one obvious question would be, one natural question to ask would be whether this holds for, for graphs or not. So in other, in other terms, uh, is it true that message passing neural networks are universal approximators of graph functions? Um, so first of all, uh, a first result by uh, Chen and co-authors uh, in 2019, then draws a, an equivalence between the ability to universally approximate functions on graphs and on one end, and on the other end, the ability to disambiguate non-isomorphic graphs. So um, the two aspects are equivalent. If we want to be universal in terms of uh, universally approximating any function defined on graphs, we also need to be able to distinguish all possible graphs. Um, if we want to, uh, on the other end, uh, distinguish all possible graphs, we need a function which is a, universe, uh, a model, which is a class of functions, which is universally approximating. Um, so in the case of MPNNs, we have just seen that they, there are graphs which they cannot distinguish, right? So this inevitably in, um, entails that the class of functions that can be represented by MPNNs is actually a strict subset of the overall set of permutation invariant functions on graphs, which are the functions we really care about. Uh, there is the strict inclusion, which uh, essentially in, uh, implies that uh, message passing neural networks are not universally uh, approximating uh, of all functions on graphs. So, we have actually a limitation, not just in terms of distinguishing graphs, but also in the kind of functions we can represent. They have an intrinsic bias, so to say. Uh, the ability to uh, approximate any function, permutation invariant function on graphs has been also related to the ability of uh, count substructures on graphs. So substructures are 
um, uh, small patterns, um, topological patterns that we can find on graphs. Think about the fact that sometimes nodes can be um, related together in triangles or rings if we think about molecular uh, graphs. So what has been proved uh, again by Chen and co-authors one year later is that MPNNs cannot induce subgraph count any connected pattern, any connected subgraph substructure with at least three nodes. Uh, we will, um, I won't, you know, go into the details of uh, what it means to do induce substructure count, but in general, um, we can think about the fact that there are some functions, uh, actually uh, all the functions which depend on counting substructures with three or more nodes, which cannot be probably um, learned by MPNN. So if we want our MPNN to count the number of rings in a certain graph, this function cannot uh, learn in any possible way. So this is, of course, you know, uh, really problematic if this is what we care about in our practical application. Um, if we go back to our example before, we have these two graphs and we see already that if we were able in principle to count the number of six and five rings, MPNNs will be able to tell them apart. This is not the case, right? And uh, this is why we can't really distinguish these two graphs. Um, so to recap, we typically measure the expressive power of GNNs in terms of uh, the ability of these ambiguated pairs. This is the most obvious and uh, popular way to uh, measure the expressive powers. Power, we have a set of yardsticks. We have a families of graphs we might or might not be able to distinguish. Uh, in, we know, or, however, because of what we just said, that these uh, measures are also related intrinsically, intimately to other, um, um, uh, other aspects. So on one hand, we have the ability to count substructures in graphs. On the other hand, we have the ability to represent uh, general permutation invariant functions defined on graphs. So the things are actually uh, interrelated to each other. But yeah, as, as I was saying, Typically, one proper way is to measure expressive power in terms of these ambiguated pairs. Um, so with this context and background, now we can cast this quest. So we would like uh, GNNs, graph neural networks, to be as expressive as, as possible, ideally universal, right? We will see that this is not uh, trivial. Uh, universality is not trivial, uh, trivially achieved on, uh, on graphs. And with this, um, let me uh, introduce you to um, this um, um, map. The idea will be that along this tutorial, we'll try to um, draw a landscape of probably expressive graph neural networks altogether. Uh, we will do this by considering on the y-axis the expressiveness of the approaches we're going to talk about, and on the right axis the complexity they, uh, of the forward paths uh, they have. So we can already start and put here M uh, MPNNs in the class of message paths in neural networks. Uh, we know that they are limited, so of course we will put them in the uh, lower part of our chart. And uh, we'll find a more precise characterization of what it means to be limited for MPNNs in the next session. Uh, so I, um, before I handing it over to Patricia, I can take maybe uh, a couple, one or two questions before moving on. How would you rank the expressiveness of simple models such as SIGN or SGCN? Okay, so um, it's, a, it's a good question. Typically these models are, are applied on a node um, classification or regression task, which is a little bit outside of uh, the scope of our talk, but uh, there is actually a paper from, I think in the, the, the group from John Bruna, where they actually started to uh, study the expressiveness of exactly these models in terms of disambiguating nodes instead of general graphs. So I really invite you to take a look. I can uh, follow up offline and maybe uh, link this work. Uh, I'll be happy to. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I'll continue from here. So we are going to like start our sessions. Like uh, the, the question is, uh, are, G are all GNNs made equal? In particular, we are going to answer this question by introducing what the WL test is and then uh, by looking at some uh, exemplary MPNNs and uh, in particular also in, uh, in our coding session, we are going to play a bit with uh, these uh, models that we introduce. So what is the idea? We have seen that uh, there exist pairs of graphs that are non-isomorphic, but that cannot be distinguished by message passing neural network. For example, these uh, two graphs uh, shown, shown here. 
But the question remains, uh, so what is actually the expressive power of uh, graph neural network or like the standard message passing neural networks? And to answer this question, we need to introduce the WL test, which so we, is going to help us. So we know that the graph isomorphism problem is NP intermediate, which means that it is not known to be solvable in polynomial time nor to be NP complete. So in general, like it's an hard task. And uh, the WL test is a combinatorial heuristic to test graph isomorphism, which means that uh, um, it is going to take uh, pairs of graphs and going to test their, their if they are isomorphic. But if two graphs are distinguished by WL, like we can, uh, we can say that they are non-isomorphic, but the contrary is not true, which means that there exist graphs that are not distinguished by WL, but that uh, are non-isomorphic. So how does this work? So given two graphs, G1 and G2, in like we are going to assign the same initial color to every node if the graphs are unattributed otherwise we can start from the given initial features that they have and then uh, like we are going to repeat until uh, the colors are stable these uh, update procedures so the color of a node b uh, at a certain like time at a certain like time of the recursion t in the graph g1 or in the graph g2 is obtained by using the hash function that takes as input the previous color of the node and then the multiset of the neighbors of the nodes so at the previous time step. Of course, like the hash function is the same in uh, the two uh, graphs. And uh, at, if at a certain step we have that the multiset of the color of the nodes is different in the two graphs, we can say that they are non isomorphic and we can stop our procedure. So let's consider some example to see in practice what this means. So in consider these two graphs. Uh, we can like we start by assigning the same initial color to every node. In this case, it is uh, purple. Then we can update the color of every node by gathering the representation, so the colors of the neighbors for each node, and uh, using uh, this update function that we have. And imagine that these are the colors that we are going to get. We have that uh, there are different uh, multisets for these uh, two uh, for these two graphs at these time steps. So different uh, histograms actually. Uh, like we can represent these multisets using some histogram, which will contain the number of nodes that have a certain color at this uh, time step. Since like these histograms or multisets are, are different, we can, uh, like this implies that uh, they are deemed non-isomorphic and the procedure stop. Consider like instead this uh, second example where we have uh, the, the color, like we, we can start with, by assigning the initial color to the nodes. Imagine this is the color we assign. Then we can start by updating the color of every node again by gathering the representation for all the neighbors. And uh, yeah, considering also the representation of the node, up, uh, applying this hash function that we have seen. And imagine that these are exactly the colors that we're going to get. We can uh, use our histograms containing uh, the number of nodes having a certain color in the two graphs. And we can see that at this, steps, at this step, the two histograms are the same. So we need to continue. So imagine we continue, we, uh, we repeat the procedure again, gathering the color of the, of the neighbors and then updating uh, the color of each node. And we can see that again, we have the same histograms in uh, histogram in the two graphs. Uh, and uh, this is uh, like, it means that we have reached a stable coloring because this color is just a refinement of the previous one. We again have the same number of nodes that have the same uh, color. So this means that they are deemed possibly isomorphic by the WL test. But actually we know that these two graphs are non-isomorphic. So this just means that the WL test cannot distinguish those two graphs as we have just uh, seen. And uh, it has been proven that the expressive power of message passing neural network is actually bounded by the WL test which we have just seen it is a necessary but insufficient condition for graph isomorphism because there exist pairs of graphs that are non-isomorphic that are not discriminated by the WL test. 
And this actually implies that also there exist pairs of non-isomorphic graphs that are not discriminated by message passing neural network, which was also like our intuition from uh, the beginning. So this also extends actually to properties that are not captured by WL, for example, the counting of the substructure, which is something we're also going to see in our practice session. So we know that we can bound, uh, we can upper bound the expressive power of message passing neural network with uh, the expressive power of the WL test. But does this mean that like all the standard message passing neural network have exactly the, the same expressive power, which is actually the expressive power of the WL? And so we are going to consider two exemplary message passing neural network. The first one is uh, the graph isomorphism network or GIN where the, each node is updated by using this rule. The idea is to have an identity message, message function where each node sends its own representation to its neighbors. And then the uh, update function is simply uh, an epsilon weighted update function with phi being uh, an MLP. And the epsilon is uh, a trained uh, uh, parameter. We are also going to consider a graph convolutional network inspired architecture. Uh, so where we have that the ident we have an identity message function and then uh, the uh, update function is, uh, um, is uh, simply an average uh, of, the, of, the message, of the messages, which will include the representation also of the node. So we are going to ask ourselves whether these two graphs, these two graph neural networks are actually equal in terms of, in terms of expressive power. And to do so, we uh, are going to move to Colab. Uh, so like you, you can run it uh, by yourself or you can uh, also follow it here uh, as we are going through the Colab notebook. So the goal in, in this uh, Colab notebook is to actually, mm, sorry is to actually showcase the differences between these two existing message passing neural network. And to do so, so we first need to install some library. In particular, we are going to make use of PyTorch and PyTorch Geometric. So then we need to import some module and we're going to make use of some functions for visualization uh, just to visualize the graphs. Uh, this is outside the scope of this tutorial, but you can take a look, it's nothing fancy. It's just to uh, plot the graphs that we are going to use. And then we are going to consider uh, three graphs that are chosen from the graph HC dataset. And the goal is to understand whether a message passing neural network can actually disambiguate them. To do uh, so, we are going to assign a different class to each graph, and then we are going to place them in our training set. The goal is uh, to uh, check whether a message passing neural network can disambiguate them, which will happen only if it can learn to correctly predict their targets. So we are going to simply uh, get the, the data that is uh, that already exists, and then we can uh, use our data set uh, function that uh, simply like read the data into memory and then uh, uh, create our PyTorch geometric data set. And then we can, yeah, we can simply create uh, the data set by calling it and we can actually, um, we can actually see how these graphs look like and they are like this. So this is our graphs that we're going to take a look at. They are composed by eight uh, nodes and they are assigned a different target. And the goal is actually exactly to see whether we can disambiguate them as we were just saying. What we're going to do is uh, to implement the two message passing neural network that we saw in the slides, which are, which are GCN, like the GCN inspired and the gene, uh, and the gene uh, graph neural networks. Note that, uh, uh, phi is going to be an MLP, so we also need to implement that routine. To do so, like we can simply use a, a PyTorch. There is nothing fancy going on actually here. It's just a, a multi-layer perceptron. 
and then we can implement our GCN uh, network, which uh, will make use of um, <clears throat> of the GCN conv uh, routine from uh, PyTorch Geometric. We it will use the as aggregation the mean aggregation. Uh, as we said, because we want to aggregate over the representation of the neighbors. And then uh, for Jin, we need to use the Jin comb um, routine from uh, PyTorch Geometric again, and that will take the MLP to implement the fee function. As we said that we want to train our epsilon, we need to put uh, train epsilon equal to true. Then we need to decide certain hyperparameters. I have decided I have chosen something here, but you can obviously change uh, to anything you would like. And then we can uh, actually train. We have a training routine that will train the model for one epoch. <clears throat> and then uh, we have an evaluate routine, which will evaluate uh, on uh, the data set. It's uh, like this is like simple. We need we just need to pass the data, collect the prediction, and then compute our metric. In our case, the metric will be the accuracy because we want to check whether we can disambiguate them. And then we can uh, run. So we instantiate our models, and then we can actually check. So how does uh, GCN do? And we can see that uh, <clears throat> independently on the number of epochs, actually it is constant at 0 0.33, which, uh, which means that uh, like only one graph is correctly classified. So let's actually visualize the three graphs. We are going to use a different color for every different node representation that is learned by GCN. And we can actually see that all the nodes get exactly the same color. And uh, since all the graphs have exactly eight nodes, it means that uh, um, the, all the graphs get exactly the same graph representation. And then of course, like, uh, graph, like our graph neural network cannot disambiguate them because uh, they have exactly the same representation. And then we can learn to correctly classify only one of them. So what about uh, Gene? We can see if we have better luck. And we can see that, yeah, of course, it's definitely better, but it's not what we aimed for because we wanted a, an accuracy of one, but this is not exactly the case. And uh, we get uh, 0 0.667, which means that Gene is able to disambiguate two out of our three non-isomorphic graphs. And we can take a look at them to see like the representation of uh, the nodes. We can see, we can again use different colors for different node representations. And these are the graphs that we are going to get. So we can see like the first graph have, have uh, different uh, node representation, different colors, but then the second and the third graphs have like symmetric uh, colors. <coughs> and you can actually see that uh, actually, so of course, like not all the nodes get the same colors as it was for GCN, but still there is there are these symmetries. So, and uh, you can see that their nodes have the same, no like more precisely, like the, the, these two graphs have the same number of nodes that have the same color. And we have actually seen that Gene is at most as powerful as the WL test, but so does this mean that the WL test is unable to distinguish these two non-isomorphic graphs and we can use the routine from network X, uh, at network X to check? This is actually exactly the case. You can see here that also the WL test doesn't doesn't disambiguate them. And uh, actually, like it has been proven, the gene is as powerful as the WL test. And uh, this actually confirms also in practice that this is what we get. We cannot distinguish these two graphs either by WL or gene. And we can look at them more closely because like maybe there is something going on. And you can see that there are, there are these two light blue nodes that are connected by to a green node. And here it's exactly the same thing. They are both of them connected to, the, to a green node, but it's not the same green node. It is, uh, those two are different green nodes. 
And so there is some symmetry going on, right? Because here we have that they are connected to a green, but here to two green that are not the same. But they are not known. But these two graphs are non-isomorphic, and this would be clear if we if if we could count the number of triangles, because there are definitely more triangles here than there are in the right graph. And uh, so the intuition is: so if, if uh, this is the case, does this mean that the message passing neural networks are unable to count the substructures? Because if they were able, like just by counting the substructure, one could give a different representation to to these two graphs. And in order to consider better this intuition, we are going to use a different uh, data set, which is the counting substructure data set, where we want to predict the number of four cycles in every graph. <coughs> and we are going to use the mean absolute error in order to uh, consider this uh, regression task. We are going to get our. Um, our uh, data set and then construct our data class. And yeah, these are simply routines in, that are going to give us the train, the validation, and the test split. And then we can consider so, what would the uh, I mean predictor do? So, we will obviously want to be better than, uh, <coughs> than a model that simply predicts the training mean. So we are going to, to implement this class that will represent our train predictor. And if we actually evaluate the performances, we are going that a mean predictor is going to get around 92 of uh, mean absolute error. Obviously, the, the lower, the better. So we expect our gene model to be lower than this uh, uh, value. And ideally, it will get zero, where it can perfectly uh, predict the number of four cycles. So we can uh, choose a certain hyperparameters, instantiate our model, and then train it. And uh, you can see that, of course, like it does better than the mean predictor, but it's still uh, something not extraordinary, right? And um, <clears throat> the natural question then becomes, so can we actually do better than a message passing neural network in counting the substructure? And in the next tutorial, we are going to show how more expressive GNNs can significantly actually outperform gene in this benchmark. So it, this was the end of the first hands-on. So if you have any question, please. There was a question in the chat, maybe um, it was actually a direct question, but I think there's no problem if I share it with everyone else. So an, uh, a question was, what if we use some more complex function, uh, like for example, we have an LSTM module or other possible architectures, more complex architecture uh, to, I, I believe this was related to uh, the readout function, right? So there are actually um, GNNs or more in particular MPNNs, which uh, use um, LSTMs, for example, to uh, perform readouts. Um, the problem with these models is that uh, they uh, lose permutation invariance. So you may have that uh, you permute the nodes of your graph and the output is different. Uh, in other words, you may have two isomorphic graphs which will get different representations. Although in practice this might be okay, from a theoretical standpoint at least, uh, it's not that uh, interesting, so to say, um, to study uh, the expressive power in particular of these functions because uh, they are not sound in, as when considered as isomorphism tests. But more in general, you can think of also, for example, um, you know, uh, vectorizing your uh, tensor representation of a node and fit it to an MLP. This would be another way to model graphs. But again, the problem is that you lose permutation variance. So in terms of ex expressive power, it is not that interesting to study uh, these models. Um, Yes, uh, essentially this is related to the question Victor asked, uh, Victor, sorry, asked in the chat. Um, an MLP um, in principle, so the, the hypothesis class of MLPs is larger than one of MLPs, right? Of um, MPNNs, right? So we could use an MLP uh, to um, converge to a, um, a universal function approximator on graphs. The problem is that uh, per se MLPs are not permutation invariant, as I was explaining. So uh, uh, at least um, if one vectorizes the adjacency matrix and consider it as, as input,
outputs. So you can do it, you will have a lot of problems in practice in terms of generalization. And in theory, because of these reasons also, because the fact that you lose invariance, not that interesting to, uh, to study uh, these models. Um, in terms of structural position encodings, there, there are some uh, questions around this. We will talk about this in the next uh, session. Yeah, and regarding the collab notebook, yes, it is an hash function of the hidden and hidden known features right before the readout layer, exactly like this. It's just an hash function that uh, uh, determines the color. Um, and also like regarding the last question about, uh, so yes, in the real scenarios, node features are usually different. Uh, it doesn't change the theorem, of, but of course, like the symmetries are going to be less. Uh, so it's, um, like it's much uh, uh, like it 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 happens much less to have graphs that are that have the same graphs the same structure are the same structure and also the same features, uh, but uh, uh, this is like a question on its own because yeah in general like you can still consider the unattributed graphs and this uh, this problem stays. Uh, I just wanted to maybe point out um, this whole. Um discussion about permutation invariance is important when we want to model um, functions on graphs. So when we are trying to solve graph property prediction tasks in particular, but if we are trying to solve, for example, a node property prediction task, it might be the case that you don't really necessarily need to be uh, invariant permutations, in, especially in the case uh, the graph is fixed. So if we imagine to have a potentially large uh, fixed graph, we won't change in time, and it's, it's that we only want to solve um, that specific problem on that specific graph, it might be okay to fix an ordering and therefore somehow also um, exploit the ordering of nodes uh, to, to learn the, the, to try to approximate the target function. So it might be okay in that case. Um, but if the graph, for example, changing, changes in time or we have small graphs and we want to do graph property prediction that it might be important to retain this form of uh, invariance to permutations. Well, hi, my name is Hagai. I'm uh, the third uh, participant in this uh, tutorial. Uh, first, I want to say uh, that uh, by far mo most of the work was done by Beatrice and uh, uh, Fabrizio, uh, so uh, they sh should get uh, all the credit for this uh, tutorial. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, high order GNNs and uh, GNNs that are uh, inspired by uh, uh, equal variance principles. Um, and this uh, session would uh, be, it's actually the third and the fourth session together. It would be divided into uh, two, those two parts, which are of course related. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about three uh, very fundamental works in, in this field of um, expressive neural networks. Uh, um, all of them led by uh, Christopher Morris, who is doing uh, uh, really amazing stuff in this uh, field. Um, we are going to see that there is a nice uh, storyline between those two free uh, papers. So, first of all, we will need to generalize the Weisfeller Lehman test. We've just seen the uh, common refinement algorithm, uh, which is also called sometimes the Weisfeller Lehman. There, there are small differences, but uh, we would not get into it. Uh, the k dimensional uh, Weisfeller Lehman is um, a generalization of that. In this generalization, instead of coloring nodes, we are coloring. Um, tuples of nodes. So in the case k equals two, we have two tuples. In the case k equals three, we have three tuples and so on. There are many variants of this WL test and it can be a bit confusing. We are not going to uh, like make your life uh, difficult in this uh, 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 tutorial, we are going to work in uh, with a specific uh, variant called, uh, 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 often called justifies for a Lehman uh, algorithm, uh, which was proposed in uh, Christopher Morris's paper uh, in 2019. And uh, the only uh, change is, change is in uh, the definition of the neighborhood around each k table. Uh, so what we actually do is similar to the illustration on the right, 
for each kind of uh, specific coordinate we have, this is the 2D case, we are going to take a needle along this uh, direction. So change all the uh, possible different vertices and to group them together into a set. And we are going to do that for each one of the dimensions. And this is exactly what we see in the definition below. Um, so there are very nice properties. It is very well researched in, in the theoretical computer science uh, um, community. Um, so for example, uh, K plus one WL is stronger than KWL and WL can separate all graphs. Um, there are very interesting uh, connections to other fields in computer science, uh, such as logic and relaxation of graph matching problems and so on. Uh, and yeah, if you want to know more about it, I really recommend a very nice book by uh, Martin Kohe, uh, as you can see here. Okay, so uh, in the first paper that I uh, mentioned, um, and uh, they suggest a network that can uh, uh, perform similar operations to the KWL test. And essentially, it's very similar to uh, what we already saw. Uh, what we have is uh, a function that is, called, is, that is composed of actually two parts, one that acts on the previous representation and one on the summation of the previous representations of the neighbors. Well, the neighborhoods are defined according to the, to the k-tuple neighborhoods that we saw. And uh, in the paper, they show that uh, KGNNs, this is how those models are called, are equivalent to KWF. So we have this alignment between those two uh, different uh, uh, um, hierarchies, uh, one of the WL tests and one for the KGNNs. Um, so first of all, it was uh, the first provable, more expressive uh, model, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which is very nice. But this model has two uh, problems. Uh, first of all, is that we have uh, very large neighborhoods for each tuple. Second one is that uh, there are many, many tuples. So, so think about, I don't know, k equals 5, for instance. This, this can be insane for uh, for uh, not so large graph. So uh, for for smaller graphs, this method works very well. But we need to kind of uh, make it more uh, uh, efficient. And the main storyline is as follows: uh, In the first paper, we saw the KGNNs, uh, which can mimic the KWL test. In the second paper, which is called Weisfeld and Lehman Go Sparse, uh, we will go and try to do uh, aggregation over sparse neighborhoods. And in the third one, uh, the authors suggest to uh, uh, sparsify the set of k-tuples. And the methodology in all of these papers is uh, pretty similar. What, uh, what the authors propose to do is to first uh, come up with a provably expressive variant of KWL. It's not going to be exactly KWL, it's going to be some uh, change, uh, some specification of this KWL test. And then they, are, they uh, show how to design neural networks that are aligned with those KWL variants. So get new hierarchies of uh, WL tests and models. Um, so in what for the Lehman go sparse, uh, the authors propose the delta k LWL. LWL stands for local WL. And as the name suggests, uh, the difference is that instead of taking the neighborhood over all this whole middle that we saw before, uh, we only take uh, neighbors of uh, the uh, uh, specific node that we replace. And this creates a significant uh, reduction in the size of the neighborhoods. Um, the paper suggests another WL variant called Delta K W L W L plus, in which they add another uh, count. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details here, but this count gives, gives additional uh, expressive power. 
And a theorem in the paper shows that delta K LWL plus with this additional feature uh, is stronger than KWL. Um, then, according to what we said, we uh, the authors uh, propose uh, delta K LGNN, which is the neural version of this new uh, WL test. And this new version, uh, neural version, uh, does essentially what we think it will do. It takes the previous presentation and takes an aggregation function over this newly uh, uh, defined um, sparse neighborhoods. And uh, the authors show that delta K LGNN is equivalent to LWN. We will see some uh, illustration in a minute. Uh, and the same goes for Delta K LWL plus. So essentially, we have two new WL tests, Delta K WL, uh, WL, LWL and Delta K LWL plus, and two uh, GNNs that are aligned, GNN architectures that are aligned with those WL tests. Um, so this is good. We get sparse neighborhoods, but uh, we still have a problem, which is uh, the number of k tuples. So again, we have n to the power of k tuples. For each one of them, we need to uh, generate uh, a color. And this is a huge amount of uh, computation. So what can we do about that? And the answer comes in the third paper, which is from this year's ICML, um, where uh, the authors introduced KSLWL. This is a new variant. And in this case, uh, we are going to take into account only k tuples that for which the induced subgraph, what's, what's left after we kick, kick out all of the other nodes, has s connected components. Now, s is a parameter. For example, when, when s equals 1, we're going to take only connected graphs. Uh, OK. And in a similar way, we're going to, uh, the, the authors define um, uh, neighborhoods for this new WL test, uh, where both the neighbors and the tuples that we consider are specified. Um, and very similarly to what we saw before, there is a, a KS LWL plus version for uh, this uh, WL as well. And as we saw before, there are uh, neural architectures, which are the neural analogs of those KS uh, LWL tests. And they uh, essentially um, do something very similar. They go over these uh, sparse neighborhoods and only update the uh, tuples that are uh, a part of the uh, uh, tuple set that we're interested in. Um, so maybe to conclude this part, we have uh, the following illustration. Uh, we have GNN, uh, we have one, one, two, one spec nets and so on. And those are aligned with the uh, uh, equivalent LWL tests. The KK LWL test is equivalent to Delta KWL and uh, Delta K LWL plus is stronger than the KWL test. Um, see that I have some questions, but I think that I don't have a lot of time. So let's delay the questions to afterwards. Unless uh, for this year, you can see if there is something uh, pressing. Uh, no, uh, I think we can continue, Guy. Uh, okay. Yeah. I think it's in the chat. Okay, so to summarize uh, SpecNets, um, which is the last paper, we the, the authors show that there is a more fine-grained control on the expressive power because we can play with K and S, and the computation complexity is reduced to O uh, and to the power of S, which is significantly better. Um, and in this calculation, we assume that K is constant. Uh, there is a related paper by Lin Xiao Zhao, uh, which is listed below, and I encourage you to take a look on that as well. 
so this brings me to the second part uh, of uh, my uh, se uh, session in which we're going to talk about equivariant models for learning on graphs. So this part is going to suggest an alternative GNN construction. Uh, and the main idea is to be invariant to node permutations. And the main question is how do we build uh, in a principled way uh, GNNs that are invariant to node permutations? Uh, we will show uh, nice connections to expressive power. And I would just like to note that even if those kind of uh, uh, models are not currently used in practice, they are very useful as theoretical tools for, uh, for studying the expressivity of uh, graphs. Uh, so I think it should be of interest to the community. Um, and this part is uh, based on those this list of papers. Uh, so if you want to kind of get into this uh, uh, equivariant graph networks, this is a pretty good list. I hope I didn't forget anyone. And if I did, I'm sorry. Um, Okay, so first of all, we need to understand how to uh, how we represent graphs, and we are going to represent graphs as an adjacency-like structure, an n by n uh, matrix where n is the number of nodes, and the node features are going to be on the diagonal, as we see here. Uh, in the same way, we can represent hypergraphs. Uh, with a uh, high order structure. So for instance, we have third order tensor here that represents this uh, face. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as for me to said in the beginning, uh, graph have symmetries, which are transformations that do not really change the underlying objects. And what are those graph symmetries? Those are permutations that we can apply to the nodes. So for example, those are two uh, equivalent graphs, but we have different order to the nodes and the resulting adjacency matrices are different. Uh, in a more uh, uh, mathematical way, we have some permutation that acts both on the rows and on the columns of the adjacency matrices. Um, and the same can be said on high order tensors. There are, we can define an, the action of a permutation group P on those uh, uh, tensors. And this uh, permutation is just going to apply uh, the same permutation to each one of the uh, dimensions of this tensor. Um, okay. So what does it mean to be invariant? to those node permutations, it means that uh, for any permutation that I have, if I apply uh, the permutation to the input, I get exactly the same output. Equivariance for the graph case means that if I apply the permutation and then I apply some operator L, then it is exactly the same as applying L and then the, and then the permutation. And um, this is summarized in this community diagram that we usually see. And it's very similar to translation equivariance, for instance, for images. Uh, we can also think about equivariance uh, for operators that go between different tensor orders. So here we have a second order tensor, uh, which is matrix, and a third order tensor. L maps between second and third order tensors, and we can still talk about equivariance in this case. And the usual way to go about building networks that are equivariant is by uh, composing those different equivariant simple operations that we can see here in gray, uh, usually with some pointwise nonlinearities. And then applying an invariant function like summation and maybe applying a fully connected network if you want. This is very similar to what uh, people do with the CNNs and uh, for sets and for graphs, we kind of do the same. Um, of course, we can think about networks that start from some uh, adjacency representation, second order tensor, and then goes up to some k order tensor. Um, and the maximal degree is called the order of the network. So we can talk about k 
uh, such invariant networks, we call them KIGNs. Okay, so this is the plan for the next uh, 12 minutes that I have left. Uh, so first of all, we're going to talk about uh, how to characterize equivariant layers. Uh, then we will talk about uh, the fact that IGNs, those neural networks, are universal. Then we will talk about uh, the alignment between KIGNs and the K-Weisfeld Lehman test. And we will uh, discuss uh, some extension of IGNs called folklore IGNs uh, in, at the end of, the, of uh, this uh, session. Okay, so the first was to kind of consider applying equivariant functions to uh, tensors and high order tensors uh, is a paper by uh, Rishi Kondor et al. from uh, 2018. And they proposed several simple equivariant layers that can be applied to those representations. Those are mostly simple tensorial operations like uh, element wise products and projections and contraction and so on. Uh, and they show that these uh, primitives, when uh, combined together, can give pretty nice uh, performance on several data sets. Um, in our paper uh, from 2019, we tried to characterize all linear equivalent functions between K order tensors and L order tensors. So we tried to do something a bit more general. Uh, the reason we work on linear uh, functions is uh, well, two reasons. First of all, it's easier than working on polynomials. And second of all, uh, uh, this, uh, this is something that, that people usually do, right? For, for images, we use convolutions, uh, which are uh, transition equivalent functions. For uh, sets, we use deep sets for uh, layers, which are uh, also uh, linear. Um, so it makes sense to try the linear equivalent layers first. Uh, I will not go into the details here, but each one of those operators can be described as a tensor with the K plus L dimensions. And those tensors have to obey to some fixed uh, point equation as we see here. And in the paper, we show that this uh, uh, equation uh, can be solved quite easily. Again, I'm not going to go into details here, but the result is that we have a linear subspace of maps of dimension Bell number of K plus L. Bell number is the number of partitions of a set. Um, and the basis itself is composed of several of indicators of subsets of index sets. And I don't want to get into too much details here because I can talk about it for, for a long time. For our purposes, that's all what we need. We, we have a very simple, uh, nice way to characterize those equivalent layers. And essentially what we do is we define our layers as a summation over those uh, 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 indicator uh, functions uh, with learnable parameters. Um, the implementation itself can be tricky. So we suggested a new uh, basis whose elements are summations of the original basis. And this actually gives rise to a more interpretable uh, uh, basis that is easy to implement. And basically what we have there is uh, operations like summing over the rows and uh, broadcasting to the columns and stuff like that. So it's uh, really simple operations. And this kind of thinking was generalized uh, a year later by a, a very nice uh, paper by Al Bouye, um, which shows how this pooling and broadcasting happens in higher order tensors. Uh, so we have a characterization of those equivalent layers and we know how to um, implement them. Let's talk about the expressive power now. So, uh, in uh, a different paper from 2019, we have shown that if you use very high order tensors, uh, then we can, you can actually approximate any continuous invariant function on graphs using uh, K IGNs. Uh, of course, this, uh, this is not practical because uh, it needs uh, very high order tensors. 
Um, very nice um, uh, follow-up works uh, improved the upper bound and extended the uh, universal approximation to uh, uh, equivariant functions. So I encourage you to go and take a look on those papers as well. Uh, and that's what I'm going to say about the universal part. So what we actually have is universality, but it's very not practical. The next uh, topic is the relation to KWL, and this is a more refined version of, uh, of expressive power for those networks. So we have shown that KIGNs can, uh, uh, can uh, mimic the KWL test, they can uh, uh, implement it, and uh, we really didn't know if uh, it is upper bounded. This is something that Flores Geertz in a very nice paper from 2020 showed that KIGNs are upper bounded by KWL. So we have a complete uh, alignment between these hierarchies as well. Um, okay, so essentially what we have is the following uh, hierarchy of the WL tests. Here we have message passing and KIGNs and, and two IGNs, and here we have KIGNs. Uh, and now I will go to the final part of my uh, session. Um, so what can we do uh, to extend IGNs? And one idea is to go to higher order polynomials instead of higher order uh, tensors. Uh, specifically, one thing that we tried is to add matrix multiplication. And sorry. And we could prove that two IGNs with matrix multiplication uh, is equivalent to three WL, which is uh, nice. And we do that by aligning it with another hierarchy that we didn't talk about called the fault loop WL. Uh, and we can even use a smaller subset of linear equivalent layers, uh, which results in the following layer that if concatenated several times, can uh, we can show that it can mimic the KW uh, the three W test as well. Um, and so essentially, what we have here is three MLPs, uh, and two of them are kind of uh, we apply a matrix uh, multiplication to them. Um, okay. So uh, in another, uh, I think, uh, amazing paper uh, that kind of generalizes everything that we discussed, um, Azizian and uh, Lelage show that uh, uh, proposed folklore GNNs, uh, which are a kind of GNNs that have this generalized uh, multiplication between the tensors, and they show that it is aligned with the uh, k plus one w. Um, so before I, I complete my part, I just wanted to say that we talked about this uh, node by node representation or higher order node representations. Uh, there is a different way to think about that. Uh, this was proposed in the paper that we already discussed by Albuya from 2020. Uh, they propose to use incidence tensors instead of adjacent tensors. So what does it mean? It means that instead of having nodes by nodes matrix, I will have nodes by edges or nodes by faces or things like that. Uh, and they study the uh, way uh, equivariant linear layers uh, behave on, on, on those representations, which is essentially a generalization of what we did in our 2019 paper. Um, Thanks, Agai, for the great job in staying in time. Um, we're going to move now to uh, session five. So uh, in this session, we're going to talk about feature augmentations for expressive graph neural networks. Uh, but before we dive into that, we had said we wanted to um, draw our uh, landscape of more expressive approaches. And we have already encountered some new architecture. So let's try to ch uh, you know, chart them here. Matricians presented GCNs and uh, Gene. 
So we know that they are both message passing models. So we would like to put them here in this uh, yellow uh, subset, uh, orange subset. GCN is less expressive than MPNNs in general. Um, so we would put them like slightly below, but they have the same asymptotic complexity. So the two models will be aligned uh, vertically. At the same time, we know that uh, graph isomorphism networks are um, the most expressive MPNNs one can come up with. So we will put them here. Uh, at the same time, a guy has introduced higher order approaches, including equivalent models, and they uh, uh, form a hierarchies where we have that they work on um, uh, k tables instead of uh, simply uh, nodes. And this uh, shift in uh, the computational paradigm is such that uh, they gain expressive power, which uh, you know as a function of k. So the larger the k, the higher the expressive power they get. So they go up and up in the in in our um, in our landscape, but at the same time, the the computational complexity increases uh, essentially exponentially in k uh, and polynomially in the in the size of the of the graph in the number of nodes. So we would um, uh, so as as k increases, this model approach the upper uh, right corner of our plot. Uh, as a small detail. We, I've put a question mark here uh, right above uh, delta two, uh, delta k in general, LWL plus methods, because although it's been proved that they are more expressive than KWL, uh, it's not, um, um, or at least to the best of my knowledge, it's not clear whether they are more expressive than k plus one WL. So we keep it uh, like this and we, we can try to uh, um, uh, cover this case uh, probably in the future. Uh, but now let's get back to our session. We want to talk about feature augmentations. So let's start with a small recap, and then we're going to talk about a few models in this uh, in this area. So uh, in general, uh, we the problem, as I was saying, with higher order GNNs, including the equivalent models, is in their computational complexity. And I argue, I would argue that this uh, computational complexity is mostly in the, this paradigm shift, be, be you know from uh, nodes to node tables. So if you wanted to really uh, keep their pros of um, uh, probably um, powerful representational power, um, but at the same time we would like to keep the computational complexity under control. The idea would be to try and remove this um, um, constraint in some way. Um, in a sense, we can summarize uh, our aim as the following. We would like to keep message passing as a computational primitive, which we like because it's not wise. And, and because of this reason, uh, it keeps the complexity under control. It's also sparse. Uh, but you would like to remove the bottleneck in the, the cap in expressive power that is intrinsically uh, related to this uh, computational approach. So the question is how to do it. And if you want to really uh, dig up the, um, the root cause behind this um, uh, bottleneck in expressive power, uh, we can say that the problem is really in the fact that the message passing process is anonymous. So whenever messages are exchanged between nodes, um, there is no information about the sender of a message that is retained throughout the architecture. This has been explained very well also in, uh, in visual terms by Andreas Lucas in, uh, uh, in, in his paper, where if we say that we have this uh, original topology and we focus on the node at the bottom here, after two message passing steps, the node at the bottom would like to try to reconstruct the enclosing topology, but actually two different con non isomorphic configurations would be equally probable uh, and likely. So the node at the bottom, given the anonymity of the message passing procedure, will find itself in uh, uh, puzzle and this ambiguity in uh, deciding whether it's part of a fork leak or of a regular graph. If we instead, what's interesting is that if we instead keep this information about the sender of messages, we can actually uh, solve this problem without ambiguities. So if we assign each node a specific node identifier, then uh, the node at the bottom is perfectly able to uh, solve this task and uh, answer yes, uh, it, it is part of a fork leak rather than a regular graph. Um, in a sense, node identification solves these ambiguities which arise from local sim similarities in, in, in graphs. And as, as an, a further additional example, I would like to report this interesting um, illustrations from Sato and co-authors. Uh, the, the idea is uh, if we take a look at these two graphs, which we know are not distinguished by message passing neural networks, and again, we take a look at the uh, node at the bottom here, the node at the bottom would like to say in the case of the uh, graphs or of the graph on the left, that this is a part of a triangle and not of a six cycle. But the computational trees 
uh, for uh, in both the two cases are exactly identical. So there's no way uh, the, the node can disambiguate between these two, two scenarios. On the other hand, if we assign nodes uh, unique identifiers, what, what the node at the bottom could do is it could realize that after a three message passing step, its identifiers gets back. And this is enough to uh, state that this node is part of a triangle rather than a six cycle. So node identification can also give us uh, an intuition on how to uh, actually be um, aware of local substructures around nodes. So this is really a powerful idea. We would like to recap. Um, we would like to then somehow uh, give message passing a notion of node identification to keep message passing as a sparse, efficient, node-wise computational primitive, but at the same time gain an expressive power. So we think we have an overall model, let's say H, which applies in fact an MPNN, but the difference is that it doesn't apply the MPNN to the original graph. Uh, so in terms of connectivity and of features, it applies the MPNN to the original connectivity, but the node features are augmented, let's say, with a form of identification of the nodes, let's say R. So the questions, of course, are how to choose these identifiers R and what is the expressive power of these uh, approaches. And also, we would like to probably uh, take a look at possible downsides. So let's start with the, the simplest approach. We can actually sample random values from a real value distribution to uh, generate uh, IDs for the nodes. This is an approach that's been proposed by um, Abud and, and Sato uh, concurrently in 2021. Um, it has several advantages. Um, there is a small E uh, dangling around here. Let's get some context for this little E. So um, what's interesting about random uh, features is that uh, if they are sampled from a, a real value distribution, then with probability basically one, every node will be assigned a distinct identifier. So and this is exactly what we want. We want a unique identifiers. On the other hand, the, the dimension E uh, of the random features is independent on the graph size, which is, uh, again, another advantage we would like to retain. This would be in contrast, for example, to one of the encoding schemes, uh, which would depend uh, linearly in the, in the size of, um, of the vertex set. So there are some uh, very nice properties. Uh, but what about expressiveness and, and possible downsides? In terms of expressiveness, the uh, Abud in, in, uh, and co-authors in, uh, in their paper, they showed that actually this model that we call RMPNN is as powerful as it can be in the sense that it is universal. Of course, it's not universal uh, in, in terms of function approximation as we have defined uh, previously. It's universal in a probabilistic sense because you see now H is in fact a random value. Um, so we would not need to slightly adapt our definition of universal uh, function approximation. The others do it in terms of epsilon delta approximation in, in layman terms. In, intuitively, what we, what, we, what we mean by this is that for a certain target function defined on graphs, uh, there exists uh, um, uh, an RMPNN, which approximates this function with precision epsilon and probability, um, precision epsilon, epsilon with probability one uh, greater than one minus delta. Um, in terms of possible downsides, well, the most obvious thing is that these models are not technically invariant as we have introduced the concept of invariant, right? Because um, random um, identifiers are assigned completely arbitrarily and they do not depend in any, in any way um, to the order of the nodes, for example, right? So they don't essentially permute with node features and connectivity. Uh, but the, the authors um, argue that this model still is invariant in expectation, right? So this might be enough or might not be enough. Uh, in terms of uh, experimental observations, what's interesting to see is that, well, this model indeed can solve uh, tasks which require expressive power greater than 1WL, as we were expecting from the theory. What's observed is that, unfortunately, um, they require um, larger, um, longer um, uh, trainings to achieve the desired uh, results. So in general, the convergence is lower, even though their computational complexity is actually very enticing because it's still linear in the number of ages being still uh, an MPNN essentially. Um, other interesting facts are that the authors themselves uh, observe they, this model seem to require very, very delicate tuning, and they seem to struggle to learn features which uh, belong uh, to different expressiveness classes. Um, here we are reporting, by the way, the, the plots directly from the original paper. Um, 
uh, if we want to summarize, we can say that on our MPNN essentially might struggle in practice because what happens is that it must jointly learn two things. One is invariance to permutations, as we know, because like this is uh, the main symmetries of graphs. And on the other hand, uh, independence on the random features, which are of course arbitrary values. So uh, Arnar and PNN should learn these two biases directly from, uh, from scratch um, and during training. They are not wired into the architecture itself. This might be one of the reasons why it's harder to train. Um, so if we want to uh, go towards a possible uh, invariance, what we can do is we can um, try and use averaging schemes. So um, the idea would be uh, we, instead of using random features, we use um, node indexes as fe uh, features for uh, augmentations in the form of, um, let's say, we, we typically call them colors. The thing is, it's not, we just don't assign uh, indexes to nodes and run an MPNN. We do this for all possible coloring, so all possible reorderings of the nodes. And after we do this for all possible colorings, we aggregate the resulting representation. So it will look uh, like something uh, which resembles the following procedure. So we obtain our colorings, we run our MPNN, uh, we save the representations and uh, repeat for all possible colorings and in the end aggregate the, the results um, or average the results. The way you can uh, aggregate the obtained representations is may vary. We have different models. We have uh, relational pooling from Murphy encoders. We have the cliff model. We also have more sophisticated schemes. Uh, you can take a look at the frame averaging paper from Clooney and encoders uh, from 2021. Uh, but let's get into now some uh, results. So if we take a look at the cliff model, what happens is that the authors show that this model is not only deterministic and invariant because of this averaging procedure, it's also universal. So this is uh, as powerful as it can be. Uh, the problem with this approach is that, of course, if we are averaging of all, po all possible reorderings of the nodes, in the worst case, the computational complexity gets factorial in the number of nodes, which is, of course, intractable. So the others propose actually a randomized uh, algorithm where we only sample we, uh, uh, some numbers, say k, of colorings, and we uh, we only use them and average on, on top of them. As soon as k is smaller than all the, post the number of all possible colorings, what happens is that uh, in clip uh, turns into k clip, which is randomized, stochastic. And um, although it's uh, randomized, the um, um, authors show that this model is still invariant in expectation and universal, again, in expectation. This is interesting because this holds for any possible value of k, even for k equal one. So at this point, what happens is that k becomes another parameter we can tune to play between uh, the to find the right compromise between uh, on one hand variance of the stochastic algorithm, on the other hand the complexity, computational complexity. Um, with k equal one, of course, one clip essentially boils down to our MPNNs. Another form of feature augmentation uh, is uh, that of positional encodings. This is, I, I guess, uh, interesting in the sense that we can, um, in, in, there are some approaches which use positional encodings either on nodes as global positional encodings or edges as relative positional encodings to essentially uh, try and adapt uh, popular architectures uh, in, uh, in other uh, modalities over graphs. So this is the case of, for example, transformers or graph convolution. So in, bo in both the two architectures, we would like to have a form of global orientation graphs. And this is not typically um, uh, available. So you need some additional exogenous information to uh, get a spatial um, um, information about locations of nodes in the overall graph or nodes between each other. So this is typically done with uh, either the eigenvectors of the Laplacian or other operators such as the adjacent symmetrics. Sometimes uh, uh, one can also use centrality measures, although I believe this should be categorized more as structural encodings. We're going to talk about this in a second. Uh, and in terms of um, relative uh, edgewise position encodings, we could use either gradients of global encodings or even other forms of encodings ranging from shortest path distances between uh, nodes or diffusion kernels. And um, in, in this case, well, global and relative position encodings can be used in self-attention layers applied directly on graphs. 
And this is the case of spectral attention networks or and reformers, for example. So you can use positional encodings on nodes as token positional encodings, uh, where tokens are nodes. Uh, we can also use um, a relative edgewise position encodings to modulate pairwise attention scores. We can also use uh, the same relative position encodings to weight aggregations in message passing and define a proper form of uh, directional convolution, which can also use anisotropic filters. And uh, this is the case of directional uh, graph network by Bernie uh, in 2020. What's interesting about this approach is that even though the motivations were different, so we're not directly uh, aiming at getting higher expressive power, in fact, we have these interesting side effects. So we gain in expressive power in some cases. Graphformers and directional graph networks actually have been proved to be strictly more powerful than 1WL. And even spectral attention networks are, have been proved by the authors to be universal when one uses the full set of uh, eigenvectors of the Laplacian. But this result, uh, I would say, is to be taken with a grain of salt because whenever we use uh, the eigenvectors of the Laplacian, a whole set of new, uh, um, of new um, symmetries come into play that uh, require being taken care of. Um, so to recap, we have as pros that we have strong deductive biases for, uh, for these approaches. They are mostly deterministic and attractable computational complexity, which is the one of transformers and uh, convolutional networks um, on graphs. Um, the, on the other side, um, we might require some preprocessing, for example, to compute the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. We have other symmetries coming into play, although there is some recent work from uh, Lim and co-authors on how to handle the symmetries. And in general, uh, what's interesting is that we really don't know what's the upper bound for, for some of these models, which could be um, area for future research. So if you now want to place these new models in our landscape, what we have is, well, at the really top of our landscape, we have all these uh, models which use uh, unique node identification mechanisms. So on the really top right corner of our landscape, we have infinite clip, which is the clip algorithm using all possible colorings and relational pooling from Murphy. These models are universal, but also may become intractable. So really they are at the top right. So we have high expressiveness with high complexity. And then we have this all horizontal line of uh, K-clip, uh, which uh, are um, stochastic algorithms. So uh, results are an expectation. And the computational complexity um, goes down as uh, K decreases up to the point where we have one clip, which corresponds to R and PNN. And um, we have some caveats, some warnings. Let's rem remind ourselves that whenever we use these models, not only invariance is only an expectation, we have that uh, they, they might require some more uh, care in optimization and tuning. And then we have uh, graphformers and DGNs. We know that they're strictly more expressive than WL, so we would put them above MPNNs and 2IGNs. At the same time, we don't really know what's the expressive power of this approach, the upper bound of these approaches, right? So we put this uh, question mark here. Um, we have Kaysan, we have discussed about uh, its potential universality, although with this might require some um, ending of some symmetries, so to be taken with a grain of salt. And finally, we don't really know what's the relation between these models. We know they're strictly more expressive than 1WL, but it's still an open question whether one is more expressive than the other. And with this, we end this session. And uh, um, I would uh, directly go into the next session and maybe uh, um, uh, answer a few questions uh, right after that. OK, so let's continue. Now, in this session, we're going to talk about substructure aware models. So as a recap, we have on one end higher order GNNs uh, with polynomial complexity and invariance to permutations. On the other hand, we have message passive networks with node identification mechanisms. Um, in general, uh, the thing about them is that uh, on one end, we have uh, invariance. On the other hand, we have invariance and expectation, but linear complexity. The, in practice, the MPNNs with node identifications, although they might be um, an interesting choice. In practice, they have a series of caveats to take into consideration. Essentially, they are trying. They, they try to uh, learn uh, inductive biases directly um, instead of being wired into the architectures. So, um, an interesting question to ask is what's in between these two models, right? 
And uh, in this session, we'll try to answer this question where we want to keep you know, expressiveness, permutation, invariance, but also um, complexity do this uh, as, as, as low as possible. We want to still work with sparse methods. I believe that uh, we can recap this uh, desideratum as we want some form of node identification which retains equivariance. And a great candidate is actually um, substructure based encodings. So the idea is, would be to collect statistics about the presence of substructures in the graph. We were talking about the presence of rings or triangles. We can think about clicks, for example. If we locally aggregate the, pre the number and statistics of these uh, substructures, we can come up with some encodings that I think are interesting uh, because of, some, of a few reasons. Firstly, they can encode strong inductive biases. We know that in most of the cases, they might uh, be related to uh, the, the kind of task we are trying to solve. They are predictive. On the other hand, they cannot be computed by MPNNs, as we've just seen. So uh, this would arguably increase the expressive power. And also, they are generally equivalent. So the, the, recipe would, the recipe would look something like this. So we choose a substructure bank, let's say H. Let's say that in this bank we put a you know, six cycle and a six um, and a five uh, cycle. There are some patterns we would like to match on top of the input graph. So if we want to match the six cycle on top of the decaline uh, molecule, we would match it twice on both the two sides of the molecule. And now for each node and substructure, we can count the number of matches and we can use these matches uh, to uh, augment uh, node features, pretty much as we did with global position encodings, with the difference being that now we are uh, completely um, uh, equivalent. Uh, we call them structural encodings. So to give uh, an example, this, uh, we, have, we want to distinguish decaline uh, from bicyclopentyl. We can't do it with standard MPNNs, but as soon as we match these substructures, we have a form of pre-coloring, which allows to actually disambiguate these two graphs. So in this specific examples, of course, the two graphs would be distinguished already from the pre-coloring, but in more interesting cases, actually there are works showing that um, uh, message passing or if you wish color refinement may actually um, capture also features related to substructures, more sophisticated substructures, not in the original bank. So this would be the idea, right? And we can formalize this concept by considering substructure isomorphisms and induce substructure isomorphisms. There's a slight difference between the two. Uh, I won't get into the details now, but the idea is that we can formalize this in, a, in a precise mathematical terms and construct these encodings for the graphs and, uh, and the substructures we care about. And then we can take these encodings and use them to directly um, um, feed the message function. If we feed the message function with these encodings for both the sender and the receiver node, then we can modulate message passing based on the presence and number and frequency of these substructures, right? And this is the approach that is uh, considered in graph substructure networks, uh, work from uh, Boritzas uh, and Calders in 2022. Um, the uh, interesting thing about graph substructure networks is that they are strictly more powerful than MPNNs when the bank contain either uh, substructures uh, other than stars, when they are meshed directly in terms of isomorphism, when the substructures are meshed in an induced way, uh, they are strictly more powerful than MPNNs when the substructures contain uh, nodes, uh, sorry, um, patterns with at least uh, three nodes. And other things, uh, GSNs can be not less powerful than 3WL, even with small substructures. So even with four clicks, we, for example, can distinguish two pairs of strong, sorry, uh, one pair of strong Legora graphs, which is not distinguished by 3WL. So all in all, we can improve the expressive power of GSNs by, of course, enlarging the, uh, the, the substructure bank, although we might incur in, uh, incur in high preprocessing costs. Uh, uh, we have, um, I've decided to report some um, co uh, results on experimental benchmark. This is the molecular benchmark zinc 12K. Uh, the idea is to predict uh, constraint solubility for molecules. What's interesting to notice is that GSNs in general, uh, so the, the additional expressiveness uh, help in uh, getting um, in getting performance better than standard message passing neural networks. And I also wanted to stress the fact that the choice of the substructures in, is important. So even though uh, paths and trees allow to disambiguate, um, um, like a larger disambiguation of nodes in the sense that 
this the you know the nodes will be discriminated uh, almost uniquely. Uh, in practice, uh, they perform um, uh, worse than is considering cycles in the test set. So cycles tend to allow GSNs to generalize better on this specific benchmark, arguably because cycles are very important in molecular modeling tasks. Um, so these models are expressive, they retain linear complexity because of they simply uh, essentially run message passing and their permutation invariant. Um, the problem uh, with these approaches might be the fact that we need a way to design uh, uh, our substructure bank and in general um, we uh, might need um, uh, to take a, a look into some more sophisticated aspects. One thing is say that we are working with almost complete grass where though uh, although we have some form of um, uh, edge weight so in this case these two graphs would uh, look the same to um, um, substructure um, matching procedures right if they don't take into consideration edge weights but there are some real world applications where edge weights would uh, for example um, convey some information about the strength of an interaction for example in the case of protein interactions so in practice, we would like our architecture to learn end to end which are the substructures to uh, which are more important, most important in one graph with respect to another. And this is not possible unless we modify the, the preprocessing of GSNs um, in a way to also account for edge weights. But this is not trivial to do because, of course, we don't really know a priori was the right threshold for, for the weights for the interactions to consider. And also, sometimes we might also want to perform I order modeling. So we would like to effectively consider higher order um, structures such as rings, for example, in molecules as first class series. And we would like to represent them directly in before message passing on top of them, because in some cases this might be ideal for certain applications. And uh, there is a, um, a series of models which try to do this by generalizing graphs. So instead of working with graphs, the idea would be to work on topological generalization of graphs. One such generalization uh, is cellular uh, complexes. Cellular complexes are um, generally constructed uh, recursively. We start from a set of nodes, and then we keep gluing the boundaries of k order, um, sorry, of uh, k dimensional balls uh, to uh, the cells in the previous iteration. So in this case, we would glue the uh, extremities of segments to nodes, and we can keep doing this. So once we do it, we obtain a graph, but we can also um, glue the boundaries of two-dimensional balls to um, the uh, two edges of the graph. And in this case, we obtain a two-complex. Now, these objects are generalized in graph, and the gluing maps induce boundary relations, which interestingly, uh, give us access to a whole new set of adjacencies. For example, in, in view of these new uh, relations, we can say that two edges are adjacent because they share the same bound, the same co-boundary, so that they are in the same, um, in the boundary of the same um, two ball or two set in this case. Um, the idea is that we can also not just um, think of a model to be applied to cellular complexes. The idea would be that we could take a graph and instead of considering it as a one complex, a one dimensional complex, we can come up with an artificial lifting procedure which would take our graph and uh, move it upwards to an higher order cellular complex. And as long as the lifting is scaled from preserving, so as long as it does not alter the structure of the graph, we can then define message passing procedures with a one WL lower bound. So examples are the following we can take every um, H click in the graph and transform it into a H minus one cell in the complex uh, for a certain H smaller than K. We can also take H rings in the graph and transform them into two cells with H smaller than K. If you do this, then we can model um, uh, graphs as higher order cell complexes and define message passing on top of them, where essentially the idea is that we don't just run message passing between nodes, we run it between uh, every possible cell at every dimension of this hierarchical structure. And the update function does not just get in, as input uh, the um, messages from adjacent cells in terms of you know, upper adjacency, it can also get a message from uh, boundary cells. So in, in, in practical terms, an edge, for example, can get messages from nodes and adjacent edges according to the boundary relation. 
uh, we can show that CWNs are strictly more powerful than MPNNs uh, when we use induced cycle or click liftings with K uh, greater or equal than three. And when K is greater or equal than four, they are not less powerful than 3WL. In practice, this works. Um, this model works very well. Again, on the zinc benchmark, these are results that are reported in the paper at the time of publication. So, recapping, we have that uh, we can maintain permutation invariance, expressiveness, and sparse computation for these models, um, because again, even in the case of cellular message passing, this is sparse, is local. Um, and um, we have seen that there might be, it might be a little bit tricky to choose which substructures to consider either in the initial preprocessing in GSNs or in uh, the uh, lifting procedures for cellular uh, networks. Uh, there has been uh, an interesting work from, uh, um, uh, by Barcelo and co authors in 2021, which study ways to um, uh, design the bank based, uh, which uh, leverage uh, the theory of sub subgraph um, homomorphisms. But yeah, uh, in general, also there is another aspect that the preprocessing might be um, intractable in, in some cases. There are specific algorithms for rings and clicks, but in some cases for general substructures, this uh, um, preprocessing might, uh, have, might be expensive. So let's put our uh, models now into our map. GSNs, uh, they have the same asymptotic complexity, at least for the forward pass of standard message passing neural networks, but they can go higher and higher in terms of expressive power. With the caveat being that they might require some selection of the substructures and the preprocessing might be um, in some cases uh, expensive. And we put uh, CW networks or so cellular message passing networks here, shaded in green because they are higher order as well. Um, we know that can, they can be um, more expressive than 1WL, but when we use induced cycle liftings, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we don't really have an upper bound that has been proved. In the case of K clicks, uh, we have um, uh, a work, uh, the work by um, uh, Gertz, uh, and we will mention this also in the final session. Uh, it is proved that actually when you use K clicks, you are upper bounded by KWL. But again, this is not clear what's the lower bound for these approaches. And also just a quick note on the computational complexity. We put them here because these models are sparse, but of course the, um, the computational complexity really depends on the um, number of uh, cells you, you, you obtain by your lifting procedure. So at the end of the day, it really depends on the um, substructures you choose and the input graphs. And again, we don't really know how to compare these models in between one and three WL. And I think with this, we can end this session here and I'm happy to take a few, a couple of questions if we have time, otherwise we can move to the next um, session uh, and I will hand it over to Beatrice. I will continue with the, um, uh, so with this exploration on, of practical and theoretical expressive genants. And uh, in particular, we're going to discuss the subgraph genants. Uh, we are going to see some intuition on uh, like what makes uh, them uh, ideal. We're going to see their component, uh, and then we're going to review existing methods. And uh, we are going to be even beyond uh, uh, like the, some expressive bound that has been proven. So let's recap first. We have seen uh, higher order GNNs uh, that uh, Haggai presented. We have shown that they are permutation invariant. We can have some hierarch hierarchical expressiveness. And we have seen sub substructure aware GNNs just now. And uh, the advantages are like invariance to permutation and uh, 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 like tractable complexity. We have also seen message passing neural network with node IDs that are invariant and universal in expectation. And they also have like linear in the number of edges. Uh, uh, complexity. And, uh, but in practice, we know that uh, higher order GNNs are intractable, substructure aware GNNs require domain knowledge, and message passing neural networks are actually hard to train, tune, and generalize. So we still haven't found exactly what uh, we were looking for. Of course, like all, all of these are valid options, but they all have their disadvantages. So this is why this, is, this was never a uh, like solved problem. So what about we use subgraphs? So the idea is that even though like some graphs can be WL equivalent and therefore like they might get the same histogram, 
they may contain subgraphs that are instead easily distinguishable by WL. And, uh, and, and thus one can consider, uh, instead of the graph, a bag of subgraphs uh, to gain in expressive power. So this will lead to what it is called the subgraph genans. So what are the components? First of all, we need a subgraph selection policy that will tell us how to construct uh, our bag of subgraphs given the input graph according to a predefined uh, uh, function. For example, in this case, we are shown the node deletion selection policy where each subgraph is obtained by simply deleting one node at a time. And then we need an encoder which will process the bag uh, of subgraphs. And uh, this idea has been uh, taken into consideration by several methods that have been proposed uh, more or less at the same time and very recently. They are probably more expressive than message passing neural network, but they are slightly different in terms of policy and aggregation and the sharing rules, and we're going to review them. So first of all, we can talk about TS GNN, reconstruction GNN and nested GNN, which uh, uh, share the same underlying idea. So the subgraph selection policy is slightly different for these three, but you can see that they are kind of connected and related. Um, in uh, in uh, reconstruction GNN, we consider like deleting uh, k node at a time, where k can also be one, of course. In nested, uh, uh, it is considered like the egonet policy, where the, each subgraph is obtained by simply considering the egonet around a certain graph, and then all the uh, other pol other similar policies are considered in the SGNM. Regarding the encoder. Uh, they all feature uh, a CMEs network, which simply performs message passing independently in each subgraph. In uh, DSGNN, we have like a similar idea. In DSSGNN, sorry, uh, the subgraph selection policy will be one of the uh, one one of these listed here. And then uh, the representation of a node in a subgraph is not only obtained by the CMEs component that acts independently on each uh, subgraph, but there is also this uh, message passing uh, component in pink that acts on the aggregated representation. And uh, indeed, uh, like these two, rep these two representations are going to be summed to obtain then the new representation of a node in a certain subgraph. Like similarly in IDGNN, we have again this message passing component that acts on the uh, subgraphs. Uh, the subgraphs are obtained by using a marked ego network. And uh, this uh, message passing component is called the heterogeneous uh, message passing. And uh, like the idea is to have, it is to actually distinguish the messages that comes from the uh, marked uh, node so that they have a different weight. In uh, GNNS kernel, we not only have the CMEs component, which is also the one that was proposed by the previous methods, but we also have this fuse layer, which also considered the representation of uh, the node um, in, for example, like, at, okay, of course, like at the previous step, but also the uh, aggregation of all the representations in the subgraph and also the representation of a node uh, in uh, all the other subgraphs. So it has like these three components that are then used together. And in general, like, of course, like they, uh, th these uh, subgraph GNNs are slightly different, but they share a common idea, which is to be tractable, equivariant and domain agnostic, and also strictly more expressive than uh, message passing neural network. And the, but like, we know that they are strictly more expressive expressive than message passing neural network, but we haven't actually analyzed what is the upper bound in their expressive power. And if we focus on node-based subgraph GNNs, which are actually the most popular selection policies, and as exemplary cases of those, we can consider ego networks or node marking or node deletion policies. Then we have that subgraphs and original nodes are in a one-to-one -one correspondence, which means that each node generates exactly uh, one subgraph, and therefore it's kind of the root of that subgraph or like the center node of that subgraph. And in this case, we have uh, the we have what we call like a node base bag, which can be represented by using uh, a cube uh, like this cube, where we kind of stack uh, the adjacency matrix of each subgraph, one on top of the other. And then one can use a, a single symmetry group 
that acts uh, on the uh, on this uh, cubic tensor all together at the same time. And this is slightly different than what uh, one can do with a generic peg, where the number of subgraphs can actually be larger than the number of nodes, and therefore one cannot use the same symmetry group, but needs to use uh, uh, like the direct product of two symmetry groups, one that acts on the adjacency matrix of each subgraph, so on the node on the node pairs, and one that acts on the subgraphs. And it has been proven uh, uh, recently that uh, actually, since this symmetry group uh, uh, is exactly the same uh, as the one considered in three IGNs, uh, there is actually a connection between three IGNs and uh, node-based subgraph GNNs. And more precisely, node-based subgraph GNNs are upper bounded by three IGNs, which means that they are also upper bounded by three WL because we have seen that there is this upper bound, uh, this actually equivalence in expressive power by three IGNs and three WL. So we knew that, uh, so we now know like how to place uh, uh, these uh, methods in our sort of um, uh, line of expressivity. They are strictly more expressive than one WL and we know that they are upper bounded by three WL. And one can ask whether like, this is all the story, or there are other subgraph genant layers that can be um, designed. And uh, it has again been proved that uh, two IGNs offer, offer a design space that is tractable for, the, for designing subgraph genants, which is what is called the RAIN2 subspace. Considering this case, the update of nodes in a, in a subgraph, we, are, we can show in this figure what are the update of the off diagonal terms. So the representation of, uh, sub, of, uh, of uh, the node J in subgraph I and how to update uh, instead the on diagonal terms, which, are, which means like the representation of node I in subgraph I. We can use the same color. So we can use different color, colors to indicate uh, uh, different parameters. And uh, the terms that have the same colors are actually pulled together. And we can see that this is actually uh, all the, like some design space that one can have to update this representation II or IJ. So what we're going to use for those updates. And we can see by pattern matching that this subspace is actually expressive enough because uh, it actually contains all the possible updates that have been uh, uh, used by the non node based subgraph genants because you can see by pattern matching that these uh, um, colors and uh, uh, like exactly the terms uh, are actually inside the RAIN2 subspace. And actually in the paper uh, that is shown here, it is actually, um, it is actually also constructed a new subgraph genon that you can see again by pattern matching actually contains all the previously known subgraph genons. So one actually, we have seen that there is this upper bound and one can actually ask, uh, is the 3WL actually the ultimate upper bound or one can go even beyond that. And maybe like if we use node tuple, we can go beyond, like no tuple based policy, we can go beyond or maybe we can use uh, like base encoders that are greater than WL. And this is actually what has been form formalized in a recent paper uh, where they propose like an architecture which is called KOSAM. The subgraph selection policy consists of uh, uh, ordering ordered k marking which means that uh, tuples of k nodes are chosen also in an ordered manner and you can see here like by an example of uh, like the first subgraphs that one can choose if if it orders two nodes so if it considers two nodes so k equal to two then uh, the first uh, thing to do is then to uh, use uh, the atomic type of this tuple as an initialization uh, feature for the sub for the node in the subgraph, and then one can use uh, a message passing uh, uh, CMEs component on each subgraph uh, independently. And it has been proven that one OSAN actually captures DS GNN and minus one reconstruction GNN nested ID and GNN as kernel which means that also like contains all those architecture. And then it has also been proven that for K that is greater or equal than one, K OSAN is uh, strictly less expressive than K, than K plus two WL. And also that K OSAN and K plus one WL are incomparable. And we can see an example to understand better what it means. 
we have that for k equal to one, one osan is strictly less powerful than three wl, and one osan and two wl are incomparable. And actually, so this is uh, this concludes our kind of discussion and of uh, on subgraph GNN's theoretical discussion. We have seen that they are a candidate, a great candidate for um, more expressive GNNs because they are equivariant domain agnostic and in practice can be tractable, especially if we consider node based policies. However, of course, like the complexity is still prohibitive in large graphs because even if we use node based policies, we have one subgraph for each node. And if the number of nodes is large, this becomes. Uh, I mean, something to, to take to, to keep in mind. And we have that if we consider k osan, upper bounds can be tuned with k, but of course at the cost of an exponential in k running time. So it's still like we haven't found our final answer, but subgraph GNN seem to strike a good balance between expressivity and computational complexity. And we can finally demystify them by looking at them more closely, more closely in our hands-on session, which I'm going to uh, start now. We are going to implement a representative method of the subgraph GNN family, which is a DSGNN. We will actually show that it can disambiguate one WL indistinguishable graph, and we will we will consider how it can uh, outperform message passing neural network also in counting the substructures. So let's start again. As usual, we need to install our libraries and import the models. To implement the SGNN, we need first to implement the policy. And therefore, like we are going to consider the ego network policy, which returns the subgraph induced by the k op neighbors. So what are we going to do? This is exactly like a representative image uh, that will describe what we're going to do. We know that in PyTorch uh, geometric, we have that the, a graph is represented by its edge index. And uh, since the graph uh, is, uh, is uh, undirected, we will have the, the connections uh, like from both uh, directions. So 0 to 1 and, and also 1 to 0, for example, to represent an undirected edge. If we, construct, uh, if we consider the ego policy, we are going to construct one subgraph for each uh, uh, node that we, it's like we call the root node as usual. And then we will have that the edge index will contain the connections uh, among all of these subgraphs. Of course, we need to change the node IDs uh, in uh, a subsequent manner because we now have more nodes. There are not going to be any connection across the subgraphs because those are like distinct subgraphs that are going to be kept distinct. We need uh, to also implement this node to subgraph index, which will tell uh, for each node to which subgraph uh, it belongs to. So something like this, since every node, every uh, node has uh, three, sorry, every um, subgraph has three nodes. And consider that for simplicity, we are going to keep also the disconnected nodes uh, uh, that we have here. So for example, here five is disconnected, but we still keep it. I mean, it doesn't matter, it's, it doesn't have any uh, edges. And this is exactly what it is done here. We have our uh, graph to subgraph class that we'll uh, uh, call the two subgraph routine. And then we are going to construct exactly what uh, we discussed. And uh, the egonets uh, uh, class will, will be responsible to implement the two subgraph method which actually simply iterates over the number of nodes, over the nodes actually, and create the, the subgraph around that node. So it's actually pretty simple as we can see, and you can actually implement any other subgraph uh, selection policy just by actually changing these two subgraph methods. Now we need to implement the SGNN. We will need a message passing neural network processing each subgraph independently. And then a series of deep uh, set layers. The deep set layers will be something like this. We need to consider the representation of the node multiplied by a lead by so like considering considered by uh, multiplied by a weight matrix, and then an aggregation function that will take all the representation of uh, uh, the subgraphs in a certain graph. So that will aggregate over the representation of uh, the subgraphs in the graph, and then pass again through like some multiplied by some um, weight matrix. In our case, we are going to consider the aggregation to be the mean aggregation. And actually also, we, then we need the final aggregation me mechanism that returns a graph representation given the subgraph representation. It's, 
going to be exactly implemented as we said, because we have that X1 is like obtained by the representation of sub the subgraph multiplied by, uh, sorry, like passed through a fully connected uh, layer. And then uh, the same is done through the aggregation, which uh, it's obtained by um, calling a scatter function, which our subgraph edX, edX batch that will tell uh, um, just for each subgraph uh, to which graph it belongs to. Uh, and then we have the, we need to implement the message passing neural network uh, as a base encoder. What the only difference uh, from what we have seen before is our subgraph pool method that will simply need to aggregate together all uh, the nodes that belong to us to the same subgraph. And we can do so by constructing a subgraph edX that indeed will uh, uh, store for each node to which subgraph it belongs to. Then we can uh, construct um, a multi-layer perceptron and a gene, uh, net, gene convolutional neural network that will act as our like CMEs component. And uh, we need to use our subgraph pooling, of course, because we want to aggregate together the representation of the nodes that belong to the same subgraph. Now let's consider again our graph disambiguation benchmark. And uh, remember that we wanted to, to see if we could uh, assign a different label to our three graphs that we know are non-isomorphic. And we can say that uh, a model can disambiguate them if and only if it can learn to correctly predict their targets. Remember that we had GCM could only be some disambiguate one out of the three graphs and gene as well as the WL test could disambiguate two out of three graphs. Those were our, were our three graphs. Now, what are we going to do? We are going to use uh, the, uh, like to, we are going to construct ego networks with two hopes. And uh, again, we have our routines to construct the data set. And what we are going to do is simply run uh, the, our DS GNM. Uh, okay. We have uh, our train and the evaluate routine and we can uh, actually run. Oh, sorry, no, sorry. We need to instantiate the model and we can actually run. And you can see that actually the training metric is one, which means that uh, while message passing neural network and the WL test fail to disambiguate our three simple graphs, graphs uh, the SGNN can perfectly distinguish them. Now consider again our counting substructure task. We had that uh, um, we had 0 0.92 test MIE using a simple mean predictor and 0 0.3 test MIE which was obtained by Gene. And we obviously want to see if we can do better. We have our, our usual routines uh, and we can construct our data set. We need, uh, of course, to use as pre-transformed the ego network because we want to uh, construct the, the, the bag of subgraph. Uh, yeah, we are going to process it. Uh, this is like simply done by by making usage of Python geometric pre-transform and uh, our pre-transform edits that we have implemented. We have then uh, some uh, hyperparameters that we can choose and we can instantiate our model. Of course, our uh, loaders, and then we can uh, start running to see what uh, we can get. This hasn't finished yet, but we can already see that it is getting better than what we had because it is uh, decreasing. And uh, we are going uh, actually to see what happens uh, uh, next. But I like as a spoiler, we can I can tell you that the test performance is actually uh, around 0 0.17. And we can therefore say that the SGNN significantly outperforms Gina in this task. And I mean, just by running this for more epochs, uh, uh, you can see that uh, you can get better performances. So actually here I'm running for a fewer epoch, of course, just because of the time constraint that we have, but uh, by letting it run, you can uh, obtain much better uh, performances. And now like, uh, there is one question that naturally arises, which is, uh, are more expressive GNNs necessarily less sample efficient than their weaker counterparts? Because of course, like they are less constrained in their 
like the weight parameter sharing, like it's unclear what, what happens when you see a less number of training data. And to answer the question, we can compare um, the uh, test performances of gene and the SGNN when trained on increasing fractions on, of the available training data. To do so, we are going, I'm going to run in the meantime, we are going to construct our get curve uh, routine, which will simply iterate over an increasing amount of training uh, data that we can have. In this case, we are going to start with, uh, uh, with the 100 training data and proceed by step of uh, like 700. So we're going to run with 100 and then 800 and then, um, and then uh, yes, and so on until we arrive to the total number of training data, which I believe is around one, uh, 1,400 or 1,500. To do so, of course, we need to reconstruct the data loader at, for every, uh, at every time because we have increasing uh, amount of data. And then we need to get again our model and, uh, uh, and uh, run the, the, our uh, routines that will train and uh, evaluate. And then we can take the performance at uh, the best validation epoch and return the result. Uh, we have some routine that is going to help us. We need to wait a bit for the uh, result. But in the meantime, I'm going to proceed and see, okay, of, like what, what also, what happens for gene? Because we, even if we have the result for the S, we need something to compare to. Otherwise we don't know uh, what to do with, uh, with this um, obtained uh, results. We can actually create a gene model which is exactly equal to the one that is used in the previous session. And uh, we, uh, we need to reconstruct the data set in the sense that we don't want the ego network now. We want to use the data as it is. We have our gene model that is exactly the same. Uh, it has final layers uh, because we want to predict the output now. We don't want any uh, DS aggregation. And then we can actually call the uh, curve, uh, like we can get the curve even for the GNN and uh, we can uh, uh, see the, the result. Uh, while we wait for our results, to, so we can say, we can actually consider what are we going to do with these two curves for increasing training data. We can plot them. So, uh, we we can actually use this plot function that will simply plot a curve for each of our uh, GNN and the SGNN, and uh, it will uh, um, yeah simply plot and uh, going to see the performances. Um, I can actually even spoil spoiler you the results, but we are going to see what happens uh, uh, next, and this is exactly what happens, which means that. Uh, so the GNN, in our case, gene, is not only worse at regime, but also um, worse when uh, seeing less, a less uh, number of training examples. So these better uh, performances do not come at the cost of generalization abilities, at least for these uh, uh, data sets that we are considering now. And what happens is indeed that uh, the, there is like this sort of gap that is consistent uh, between uh, GNN and more expressive models such as the SGNN. And uh, this is even more, uh, even, even more like mm, visible for other subgraph GNNs uh, uh, such, as, uh, like, such as GNNS kernel or also the SUN model that we have introduced, but we chose uh, the S because it was like a, a nicer and simple model that you could you have seen it's uh, very, very simple to implement. So in the meantime, if you have any question, I can answer them. So just a second. Um, no, we don't have, we have a few questions in the chat, but they were related more to the uh, previous session. So I'm trying to, I was trying to answer directly in the chat. Um, I can maybe take the time to answer to one of them directly here. Uh, mm -hmm. with yeah, so there was one I could I wasn't able to reply to. Uh, Mathieu uh, was asking, how do you define the um, SN action over subgraphs with a smaller number of nodes? Uh, we don't uh, in practice. Um, so the idea would be to 
all, all the time keep uh, all the nodes in the original graph. Uh, the one you would not consider to be part of a certain subgraph, you can keep them and uh, keep them completely isolated. Uh, this is not a problem in general because in the policy you can also um, um, you can also make sure that the policy stores uh, the membership of each node um, to uh, the specific subgraph. So in a way you can use this mask um, after your computation uh, if you need to. Um, to, for example, perform readout only on the nodes in the specific subgraph and exclude uh, the ones that were isolated at the beginning, for example, um, or in general, yeah. the ones that were not part of the subgraph you, you're choosing. So in uh, theoretical terms, you keep all the nodes and you can, in this way, define the three-dimensional tensors, three-way tensors, uh, Beatrice was showing in the, in the slides. Yeah, I think that's more of an implementation detail. You can discard them if you would like. Of course you can. It's just uh, we didn't uh, hear because uh, also we wanted to keep it simple. Um, and in the meantime, I wanted just to say that uh, like this is like we have run now all, all the uh, cells and you can see that uh, this is what happens uh, actually in, in practice in this case. Okay, this is um, our landscape so far, right? Um, it's getting a bit crowded as we can see, uh, but there are some methods missing, uh, uh, namely uh, subgraph GNNs. So let's try to put our methods here in our, in our uh, uh, map. Um, so we've seen that node-based subgraph GNNs are uh, upper bounded by 3WL, and uh, we decided to put them here in this region and we shade it in, uh, in pink. We only reported some of them, not all of them, um, but of course uh, this is just because of uh, um, space uh, limitations. Um, we have that uh, DSGNN, which corresponds to one OSAN, is, um, can be uh, more powerful than WL in distinguishing some graphs, but it is not clear whether it's strictly more powerful than one WL, so we will put again a question mark here. But we know that DSSGNN um, uh, completely subsumes DSGNN, and in, in, in turn, that sun subsumes uh, the SSGNN. So we put them ordered this way uh, from, uh, um, from in, in the sense that uh, sun is above the SSGNN and the SSGNN will put them, uh, put it uh, above the SGNN. And um, another consideration is about the computational complexity, right? So for subgraph GNNs, the computational complexity is in general, um, the complexity of message passing multiplied by the, the size of the of the bag of some graphs. So if the graphs are sparse and uh, we have a maximum uh, bound on the node degree, uh, say D, then the computational complexity will be uh, N squared uh, times D. So this means that they are in between, I would say, um, uh, models like two IGNs or two GNNs, which have um, squared computational complexity, and models like three IGNs or three GNNs, which have a cubic computational complexity. Uh, PPGN um, involves uh, matrix multiplications. The computational complexity of matrix multiplication is the one which dominates the forward pass. Uh, so it really depends on the implementation you use. If you use very um, high performance implementations of matrix multiplication, then our uh, in, in all likelihood, PPGNs are slightly less um, complex in terms of their forward pass complexity than subgraph GNNs with not based policies. Uh, and also we've seen um, that, um, oh, maybe just a small note on um, expressive power, or no, sorry, computational complexity. Of course, this depends on uh, the, the graph they run uh, uh, over, right? So I mentioned that on the computational complexity is n squared times d in the case the, um, we have a bounded degree uh, assumption, but in general, it might get uh, larger if the, the graph is very dense and we, we can't make this assumption. But this is also the case for, uh, for example, um, standard message passing run networks. Um, okay, and then we've seen also that um, as uh, methods like DGN and reformers, uh, CWN, they cannot really, mm, it's not really clear what's the relation between them. Well, this is also true uh, in the sense that uh, for subgraph GNNs, in the sense that there is not uh, clear at the moment uh, whether these subgraph GNNs, which are in between one and three WL, are perhaps more or less expressive than um, graphformers or um, say a DGN, for example. So we, we keep this question marks this uh, this uh, uh, question open here. 
And finally, we have uh, seen that we have yet another hierarchy. Uh, we have uh, the awesome hierarchy. We, uh, and um, as we increase the parameter k, we get more expressive power, but at the same time, more, uh, a larger computational complexity. So if we want for a moment to uh, take a look at this, we know that uh, in general, k awesomes are upper bounded by k WL. So um, sorry, by k plus 2 WL. So in our chart, we have k WL. So we say that k minus 2 awesome is upper bounded by k WL. Uh, so we put it slightly uh, below k WL. Uh, and the same, at the same time, um, it's not clear uh, what's lower bound in terms of the KWL hierarchy, or more precisely, uh, K minus two Olson is not comparable with uh, K minus one WL. So we keep another question mark here for future works. Um, and uh, yeah, that's our landscape. It's uh, now complete. It's it's a bit crowded, but I hope this will be helpful for uh, to foster future research. And I just wanted to say we can uh, of course share uh, this material, and I'm happy to um, keep this as a collaborative effort. So if there is something which doesn't look right here in the in the landscape, I'm happy to take suggestions and uh, update it, or even add additional methods. Let's uh, recap. So we've seen that expressiveness is in general an important concept related to learning on graphs, and we have uh, really several classes of approaches. Uh, we have seen KWN inspired models, equivalent layers, feature augmentations. Uh, we have structure modulated message passing with uh, substructure isomorphisms and cellular complexes. We also have uh, subgraph chains. So we have really um, uh, many many methods that can be categorized in families. Uh, and what's interesting is that they would typically juggle with representational power on one hand, computational complexity on the other, and inductive biases. Um, it's um, a question then, like when a family of models is a good choice in general. And I tried to uh, pinpoint down a few um, thoughts. I think in general, I order methods uh, are actually a good choice when we are working with small graphs, especially when we keep the, the size of the k tuple of the tuples i. Um, they are a good choice when efficiency is not really essential, so we are allowed to um, uh, have a more expensive forward pass complexity or even memory complexity. And uh, in general, the, it's really a good choice when we want necessarily guarantees on expressive power. And this could be, for example, in specific theoretical applications um, or, um, yeah, I would say more on the theoretical side, perhaps. Um, in terms of feature augmentations, well, they're probably a good choice when uh, we have larger training data sets uh, available. And this is mostly the case for graph transformers, which uh, apparently are very data greedy. Um, they are a good choice when, in the case we think about, for example, random node identifiers, when invariants can be loosed some, loosened somehow. So if we are okay with, uh, with uh, either approximate invariants or uh, invariants in expectation. And uh, in general, this is okay when we, uh, we can afford uh, reprocessing, uh, some reprocessing. So we would require reprocessing to generate positional encodings and in more in, in specific, for example, to decompose, calculate the eigen decomposition of some operators. In terms of substructure where message passing, I think they, re they really shine when you have uh, um, access to domain knowledge. If you really know which ones are the substructures which would uh, reasonably correlate with the task you're trying to solve, they are probably one of the best choice. And also they're a good choice when, uh, again, preprocessing is okay, you have time to um, perform sub substructure uh, isomorphism or induced isomorphism or even homomorphisms. And finally, we have subgraph-based GNNs. So um, if you consider um, higher order policies, so policies which would be uh, not tuple-based, so say, for example, k awesome with k larger than one, um, in general, they would be a good choice when graphs are small because the, unfortunately, the size of the bugs uh, for um, simple policy, simple higher order policies would uh, increase um, polynomially with, with, with n. But in general, I would say that uh, they are a good compromise. They are a good middle ground between many desiderata, and they are in general a good uh, choice, uh, especially when you work in uh, settings like molecular modeling. And I just wanted to report this um, this table. Um, this is a table with results on the zinc dataset reported in one of 
the um, papers on subgraph based uh, models. And I just wanted to show uh, that, for example, in this specific um, molecular modeling uh, application, uh, subgraph GNNs, but in general, uh, even substructural aware GNNs and more expressive GNNs, they all tend to work better than, much better sometimes than standard um, message passing neural networks. Uh, this, in these data sets also, data set also, graph transformers have been shown to work very well. We're not reporting the results here, but I would encourage you to take a look at the uh, most recent works. For example, um, we have a work from Kreuzer. Um, right, so uh, limitations. So I would say um, all the results we have seen so far, uh, they are, well, actually most of them are existential. So typically they are in the form of uh, there exists an MPNN which is able to distinguish these two graphs or to learn this function or to count these substructures. But uh, this doesn't really tell us much about other aspects such as, for example, how many data you require to learn that particular function you, you, you want to learn or uh, whether these models have an intrinsic bias towards learning more some functions rather than others. So essentially the question is if um, the, the set of functions I care about is in my hypothesis class, but this is in a particular region, let's say the shaded region, how likely it will be with this specific data set and this certain amount of data that from my initialization, I will be able to get there. These are aspects which are not studied um, uh, deeply in this kind of analysis we've seen today. Um, in general, also, I would argue that uh, graph disambiguation is uh, necessary, but in terms of, you know, as a condition, but also it's not sufficient. We have uh, discussed this extensively in the chat. So uh, in general, it's a good, um, da, you know, it's, a, it, it's good to double check that your model can disambiguate all graphs in your uh, data set. It's, a, it's good because you can check that the model doesn't have blind spots but uh, obvious blind spots, but this is not the end of the story because there are other aspects which uh, are, are not directly captured and that might be, um, um, or maybe captured, but indirectly. And we might not, not uh, have no, you know, uh, an immediate knowledge about this. For example, we might know, not know whether we are able to, cut, to um, capture specific graph properties or, or not. So for sure, there is still research to do on this area to get uh, even more informative measures of expressive power. Um, again, uh, maybe um, let's, um, as I anticipated at the beginning of the tutorial, we are not covering all possible works on expressive GNNs. There are at the moment uh, really dozens or even hundreds of them. Um, so here we try to keep things high level and to you know to come up with possible uh, informative categories categorizations into families. Some of these of models in the literature might be harder to put in one bucket with respect to another, uh, even though we can also find similarities. And just want to report a few examples. There are many others out there in the literature. So we have, for example, structural message passing from Vignoc uh, and uh, others. Uh, this resembles a sort of subgraph GNN, but uh, I'm not aware of any precise theoretical results which um, uh, show that subgraph GNNs can subsume these models. It might be or might not be the case, so it's still an open question. There are other works uh, which instead build on top of the idea of um, graph and in general uh, substructure, um, well, uh, yeah, substructure automorphisms. So they, they can, I'm talking about natural graph networks and uh, autobahn, uh, they can be considered as uh, probably more sophisticated substructure aware methods. But again, uh, it's not clear how to precisely categorize these methods. Um, there are a set of related works and resources which uh, uh, pertain to uh, the study of expressive power. I wanted to mention a few papers which talk about, try to study relations between models or to reconcile families of models uh, in maybe slightly different ways than the ones uh, we have discussed today. We have a paper from Pat, Pat and Pat Noffer, uh, the, the figure we report here is directly from this paper, um, which is really about trying to get an understanding of relations um, between the expressive power of different families. And then we have a paper from Geertz and Reuter, uh, which is very interesting because it studies a general approach strategies to get upper bounds on the expressive power of a certain architecture. 
And finally, we have a series of surveys that I invite you to take a look. We have a survey from Sado. Uh, this is the, probably one of the, the, the first ones. We have uh, a very interesting survey from Morris and others on how um, Vasfather Lehman get into, got into uh, machine learning. So different variants of the Vasfather Lehman algorithms and how these variants have uh, inspired in rural architectures. And then uh, we have a survey from um, Stephanie Yegelka on uh, the theory of graph neural networks. We have not only expressive power, but also um, concepts more related to learning, which we haven't touched uh, um, upon today. And then uh, finally, I would uh, signal there is a, a book uh, about graph neural networks. Uh, it's uh, a recent book. Uh, it's Graph Neural Networks uh, Foundations, Frontiers, and Applications. Chapter 5 is entirely devoted to expressive power of graph neural networks. Um, okay. Roads ahead, uh, po uh, ahead, possible uh, directions for further research. So I think in general, we can think about learning as the interplay between three aspects. We have on one end expressiveness, but we also have trainings, training procedures, uh, and aspects related to generalization. And on the side of expressive power, at least on graphs, uh, we have made a lot of recent progress. Um, and this is what motivated this tutorial in the first place. But I believe there's still work to do. And in particular, it would be interesting to study new informative measures of expressive power, which might go beyond graph disambiguation. There is an interesting new paper from anonymous authors about rethinking expressive power genes by other properties, such as uh, graph by connectivity. Um, this is not one example. Um, it would be interesting also to get a finer characterizations of uh, the relations between the models that uh, are strictly more expressive than 1WL, but uh, upper bounded by 3WL, or for which an upper bound is not known. So if you remember, we have this question mark uh, dangling there uh, in between DGN, graphformers, subgraph uh, uh, GNNs with no base policies. Um, so there's still uh, work to do there. And then it will be interesting to try and reconcile some of these uh, fundamental classes, families together, and to find higher level connections probably between them. Uh, in terms of training, this is interesting because it's almost unexplored. So we don't really know if, at least to the best of my knowledge, it's not really clear if how we should be supposed to train GNNs in the best way and expressive GNNs in particular. So there's still a lot of work to do here, I guess. And uh, also not clear what uh, how the lost landscape of a GNN would look like. So there's, uh, there's also room for... Um, um, for a further works here. And finally, generalization. So generalization, uh, it's still underexplored, I would say. There are some works, for example, from Garg and co-authors or Liao. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I guess there are still uh, questions which uh, re remain unanswered. Uh, what's the relation with, uh, you know, between uh, expressiveness and generalization? This is not completely clear. Uh, or it would be interesting to study the sample efficiency of GNNs or the inherent biases of some architectures, and also perhaps even extrapolation properties. It would be already interesting to come up with a taxonomy of possible um, out of distribution generalization uh, um, challenges, uh, just to mention one more thing. And yes, with this, uh, I think we can end uh, the tutorial here. And yeah, I would like to thank you all for, for being here today. And um, I would also like to thank the organizers of the Learning and Graph Conference for giving us this opportunity. Um, I believe we still have time, so I'm happy to answer any other question um, live. Thank you. OK. Um, there is one question that I haven't had the chance to answer yet. It's uh, by Soledad, what data models do you think are interesting for studying generalization? Um, what data models? Um, okay, data models, I guess uh, it refers more to, um, for example, um, prototypical graph distributions. Yeah, so there are some works which um, try to study generalization with graph fonts. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure, uh, so that probably you're aware of them. Um, it's a first step, I believe, uh, and uh, it's interesting because you have you can go uh, to the continuous domain and then go try to go back to the discrete um, setting. 
uh, this would be a first step, yeah, maybe to consider graphons uh, to be able to use the tools from uh, analysis on continuous, um, you know, tools from continuous maths. But uh, yeah, I'm afraid I don't really have a strong answer to this question. Um, what I would like to say is just that in general, there are many works on um, uh, random graphs such as, you know, erdos uh, distribution coming from erdos reni distributions. Again, these are first steps, but in my humble opinion, it's a little bit detached from practical applications. So I would take this results with a grain of salt. Um, there are many uh, properties which uh, are found in real world graphs and not perhaps in uh, random graphs. So um, yeah, I would consider this uh, carefully. Uh, but I would say it really this, this is one of the most interesting directions for future works. Yeah, I can see. Oh, there's also one question probably from Derek. I'm not sure it's been answered, no? Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I have answered it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I there. think like, yeah. Uh, I mean, we can obviously discuss more, but uh, uh, yeah, not sure like about the comments, but of course, like everybody recognizes that it is uh, like there is this connection between the multi-node representations and uh, the uh, yeah, subgraph uh, GNN. So, um, like understanding the connection is uh, obviously an interesting direction. And uh, yes, there, there has been a lot of work on graph for representation, a lot like, yeah, some work on node representation. There's still missing, there is still probably missing this connection between these uh, uh, different uh, lines of work and these like different also subgroups of uh, uh, research that uh, still remain separate. I guess we are fine for now. Oh, we have one question from Floris. Um, from an expressiveness uh, point of view, the more layers, the more expressive. How does this fit with over smoothing? Uh, good question. So um, first of all, uh, the more layers, the more expressive. Um, yes, uh, of course, uh, we know that there are upper bounds. So I just want to uh, stress this once more. Um, so an MPNN will get more expressive if we have more layers, but it will not be able, will not be able to go beyond one double dot. And this will, this argument can be made for other classes. We know that subgraph GNNs cannot be made more powerful than three double and so on. So we always have to bear in mind we have this uh, really um, ceilings. Um, but yet, yeah, yeah, within this, um, you know, expressivity regions, yeah, we can get more or less um, um, expressiveness in terms of capacity. Um, it is common belief that the more layers you add, the more you over tend to over smooth. Um, I am by no means an expert on this subfield of graph GNN or uh, graph neural networks. What I would say is, I'm not sure uh, how much these analysis carry uh, over to uh, more expressive GNNs. Um, Typically what I've seen in the past is these analyses um, are, are made typically on um, um, GCNs or um, simplified GCNs. So these models where uh, you have weaker aggregators. Uh, when you have weaker aggregators, you tend to average uh, signals and to smooth out and then at the end you might have this phenomenon. It's not really clear to me whether this would happen also with standard MPNNs or more complex GNNs. Um, what I would say is that uh, probably more expressive GNNs, other uh, uh, phenomena would be even more um, 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 concerning. Maybe we have uh, over squashing, so bottleneck effects would be uh, more prominent as an as a as a, a scenario to consider. Um, and in general, literally learning uh, complex functions when you have a very deep network is something that requires more attention and uh, sometimes tricks and uh, a lot of uh, practice and experience. So we, uh, there, there's a, an experiment in, um, in one of the paper I co-ordered uh, where the idea was if you use, um, 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 I can quickly maybe show it um, just one minute. Um, so uh, I was just saying, uh, we've tried to think about um, very deep GNNs in this paper. I'm reporting this uh, results here. So the idea is the following. We have a synthetic benchmark where we only have rings of different sizes, very large rings, even up to um, 
um, uh, um, 30 nodes, for example, and you would like to transfer the information from the red node to the, to the green one. They are, they are always at the opposite sides of the ring. So when you use a, a gene uh, network, uh, for sure you'd need at least um, a number of layers, which is um, half the number of nodes. Um, let's say, depends whether the number of nodes is even or odd, but overall, you need a number of layers, which depends linearly uh, with the, uh, on, you know, on the number of nodes in the in the ring. But in principle, you can do it, do it right. So you can reach uh, the green node from the red one. What we observed in practice, though, is that at the end we really had our time trying to optimize these very deep networks, and the performance drops for, in this case from 24 onwards. So it's really a matter of finding um, better ways to optimize these networks. Um, in this specific examples, uh, what we were trying to show is that if you use a, a cellular complex network, if these rings um, are associated to two cells, then the idea will be to transfer the information uh, directly from the red node to the uh, shared uh, two cell and then uh, get it back to the uh, green node with a constant number of layers. So in some cases, these models also have this advantage. But uh, yeah, to stay on the point here, uh, yes, I believe this uh, is related to one of the aspects we have mentioned in the final remarks that is we still don't really know much about what's the best way to optimize these networks there is a streamline of works on deeper gcns and uh, i would uh, perhaps invite you to take a look at that if you are interested i can try to dig up the papers okay yeah thanks to you floris for um uh, for asking this question um yeah, there's also a matter of whether batch norm helps or not with over smoothing. I think this is a very interesting uh, direction to explore in the future for sure. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, I think we can perhaps stop here. Uh, um, okay, uh, there's some speculation from Yorgos. Uh, perhaps there exist aggregation functions even for uh, the vanilla. MPNNs such that uh, over smoothing doesn't help, for example, injective functions. But it is unknown if we can easily converge to these functions with gradient descent. Exactly, yeah. So I completely agree. And again, this is related to what I was saying. We don't know what's the propensity of our architectures to really learn the class of functions we are interested in, even though these functions maybe are in our hypothesis class. So in theory, we could get there. The question is how difficult it is for the network to be opti when optimized with gradient descent in a particular way to get really in the region of our hypothesis class we care about. Um, yes, yes. Uh, in terms of oversmoothing, if you are interested in this, there is also a paper from uh, Chris Bodnar on uh, Sheep's uh, neural networks. Um, yeah, the, the setting is a bit different in the sense that. Um, here, in that case, you have a single graph and you would like to somehow, it, you, you can think of it as a control problem. Um, yeah, but uh, there are works in this set, in this uh, domain, mostly they are on node-wise uh, property prediction tasks. Um, yeah, so I think Michael Bronstein like to think about it as you have a dynamical system, you want to control it in a way that a convergence you get in a particular space of your, um, in a particular region of your state space. And um, this is very much the, the challenge, I think. Okay, um, is there uh, anything else? Or um, Anyone wants to make any comment, even live, uh, verbally, uh, I'd happy to otherwise we can stop here. Yes, so uh, again, thanks everybody. Uh, maybe I leave uh, the last words to uh, the other speakers. I've uh, for sure uh, spoken too much. So yeah, Beatrice, uh, last words to you and the guy as well. I just wanted to thank everybody for attending and uh, for listening to us. And if you, of course, like you can ask any question you would like uh, uh, to the Slack channel or via, via email to us. And of course, like even if it's not a question, uh, uh, it's just a discussion. We we are happy to to follow up.
maybe uh, something for me. So uh, uh, thanks for being here in Vietnam for uh, for this uh, great uh, tutorial. Uh, and what I want to say is that I invite everybody here to join uh, the effort in uh, trying to get uh, expressive uh, GNS. I think it's a great uh, topic, uh, both theoretically and practically. And we are uh, very uh, we like to uh, um, collaborate. So uh, feel free to send us emails and uh, talk to us. And uh, yeah, let's have fun. That's it for my side. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, let's uh, stop the close the story here.